Chapter One of Baltimore Hats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dore. Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham. Introductory. Past and present have each their independent significance. The past gives freely to us the experiences of others the present a suitable opportunity to improve upon what has already occurred with our observation and acceptance of these privileges so easily obtained we reap the benefit of their advantages and unconsciously find ourselves the gainers both in capacity and intelligence a history of the past giving the record of events and circumstances existing before our own day bringing to our knowledge the accomplishments business enterprises and undertakings of our predecessors is a profitable study and the reader gratifies his curiosity in observing how differently things were conducted and managed a century ago as compared with the processes of the present day exciting a sense of wonder at the rapid progress that has been made in a comparatively short period of time think of it quite within the lifetime of many of us have been the most wonderful of inventions the steam engine steam vessels the telegraph and other wonders and triumphs of electricity the wildest fancy may not be styled visionary in anticipating the appearance of things still more surprising continued familiarity with the present system of making hats has the tendency in a great degree to prevent a recognition until brought to our notice by comparison of the wide difference existing between the old and new methods and this common everyday experience assists in making us unappreciative of the remarkable improvements that have been made in this branch of business only a half century ago the time required to make a single fur hat from the prepared material was fully a week and the average production was two hats per day per man with the bowing of the fur the forming and shrinking of the bodies and the handwork of finishing and trimming all of which by the aid of modern science and invention is today done by machinery more perfectly and completely at the rate in production of twenty times that of fifty years ago while the sewing of a straw hat which could hardly be done in an hour by the plodding work of the hand stitch by stitch is by the rapid sewing machine made in a minute when we think of the largest number of stitches our mothers and sisters could take in their needlework by hand and contrast it with the result of the sewing machine that spins its twenty two hundred stitches a minute we are able to gain some adequate idea of the saving of labor and while we complacently accept these marvelous accomplishments the question whether it be to the poor and needy a loss or gain is still an undecided problem with all the advantages now at our command it appears to us a matter of surprise how our forefathers with their apparently indifferent methods could profitably succeed in their labors with the steam engines sewing machines and electricity the quick accomplishments of the present compared with the slow movements of the past tend to make one think we are living in an age of wonders amounting almost to miracles what would be the exclamation of the ghosts of our great-grandfathers who with the rapid trot of an ox team drove to church miles away through the storms of winter to exemplify their devotion to the truth of their faith if suddenly they could rise and observe the luxury of the present modes of transportation in convenient palace cars and palatial steamships our comfortable and gaudy churches and our easy ways of communicating instantly with those thousands of miles away from us aladdin's wonderful experiences or the magical change by cinderella's fairy godmother would appear tame to their intense surprise in a series of articles it is proposed to give an account of the growth of the hat manufacturing business one of the most interesting of baltimore's industries how at an early period it was raised into conspicuous prominence in common with other enterprises undertaken in the active spirit which has always characterized baltimore merchants as among the foremost of their time they will also treat of its gradual growth and development followed by a temporary decline of progress caused by the civil war and its consequences and finally of its triumphant stride to place itself again in line with other leading industries of this enterprising metropolis for without doubt it holds today an enviable position among the different trades a position acquired by the thoroughness determination and perseverance of those engaged in its development end of introductory
Chapter 2 of Baltimore Hats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by P. J. Morgan. Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham. Chapter 2 Early Days. The spirit of ambition and independence constituting the fundamental principles of manhood, and inspiring a nobleness of character which in time of the country's struggle for liberty helped to give her the benefits of wise counsel, noble patriotism, and manly service, was early manifested by the neighboring colony of Virginia, as in the year 1662 she ventured upon a practical plan to encourage the manufacture of hats by offering a premium of ten pounds of tobacco for every domestic hat made of fur or wool. What resulted from this generous act we are not informed, but there is no evidence that it in any degree stimulated the production of hats in that colony, and it is a noted fact that hat-making to any extent has never flourished south of Baltimore. This city seems to have been the southern boundary line, the geographical limit in that direction, of hat manufacturing. As an offset to this enterprising manifesto of Virginia is a petition in the year 1731 of the hat-makers of London to the Lords of Trade, to enact a law forbidding the American colonists to wear hats not made in Great Britain. This law was passed, attaching a penalty of five hundred pounds sterling, twenty-five hundred dollars, for its violation. The archives of the New Jersey Historical Society for the year 1731 show that there was one hatter in that colony, and from a history of Boston we learn that sixteen hat-makers of that town were affected by the edict of these despotic English lawmakers. In this manner were the enterprises of the new continent checked, and the attempt made to crush out that spirit of progress so manifest in the brightest of the English colonies. It was the continuation of such injustice and oppression that eventually inspired a rebellious spirit to take the place of patience and submission, ending in a revolt, the termination of which secured us liberty and justice, and the announcement of our complete independence on the 4th of July, 1776. The style of hat of this period, 1731, had the sides of the brim turned up, with a front of an easy curl which, nearly resembling a cap visor, made it in shape somewhat between a hat and cap. This seems to have been the first approach toward the cocked, or three-cornered hat, afterwards so extensively used, and to Americans the most familiar of past styles, from its being a fashion of the period of the Revolution, by which it became the prominent part of an historical costume. The arbitrary law before alluded to was afterwards modified, but an uncomfortable restriction continued to be enforced upon all manufactures, for in the year 1750 the English Parliament, among other unjust acts, enacted a law forbidding exportation of hats from one colony to another, and allowing no hatter to have more than two apprentices at one time, because the colonists, if let alone, would soon supply the whole world with hats. The French fashion of this time had the brazen characteristic of its brim rising erect from the forehead, a style seemingly in keeping with the then irritable condition and reckless agitation of the French people. Planchet, in his Cyclopedia of Costumes, Volume 1, page 261, quotes a humorous description, evidently referring to this particular style, as follows. Some wear their hats with the corners that should cover the forehead high in the air. These are called gawkies. Others do not half cover their heads, which indeed is owing to the shallowness of their crowns, but between beaver and eyebrows exposes a blank forehead, which looked like a sandy road in a surveyor's plan. From the year 1750 until after the Revolution, there was but little change in the general character of style in men's hats. The custom of erecting the brims by tying or looping them up prevailed. Soon the elevation of the brim of 1750 was abandoned, and a change made by looping it at the points of a triangle, producing the three-cornered or cocked hat. This was a becoming style, we must admit, and one seemingly well suited to the independent, fearless, and patriotic characteristics of our forefathers' traits, the possession of which at that time gave us all the comforts that are ours now. The cocked hat enjoyed a long popularity, continuing in fashion until near the close of the century, when the steeple-top and chimney-pot styles, slang terms for the high beavers, came into vogue, a style which Ashton, an English writer, designates as the hideous head-covering that has martyrized at least three generations. Departure from settled and accustomed styles created the same furor and astonishment, and subjected the venturesome individual whose inclinations led an advance in fashion to the same exposure to ridicule as affects the swell of the present day, and the reporters of society doings then were as close observers, as keen in wit, and as unmerciful in criticism as any of their kin today. 
Planchet, quoting from the London Chronicle for 1762, refers to fashion of hats at that time as follows. Hats, says the writer, are now worn on the average six and three-fifths inches broad in the brim and cocked. Some have their hats open like a church spout, or like the scales they weigh their coffee in. Some wear them rather sharp, like the nose of the greyhound, and we can designate by the taste of the hat the mood of the wearer's mind. There is a military cock and a mercantile cock, and while the bow of St. James wear their hats under their arms, the bow of Moorfield's Mall wear theirs diagonally over the left or right eye. Sailors wear their hats uniformly tucked down to the crown, and look as if they carried a triangular apple pasty upon their heads. That there is nothing new under the sun is a maxim the truth of which is often verified within the limits of fashionable manners. Thus the counterpart of the present captivating custom of carrying in the public ballroom or at the private party the collapsed opera hat under the arm is seen in the fashion of 1762, the only difference being not as now to doff the hat in the house, but when promenading the street the bow was to be seen with, a pretty black beaver tucked under his arm, if placed on his head it might keep him too warm. The folded hat of 1762 differed from the opera hat of the present day also in the softness of the crown, permitting its being flattened, and the brim, as if hinged front and rear, folded at the sides like the corners of a book, while the present opera hat, constructed with jointed springs, allows its cylindrical crown to be flattened down to a level with the brim, which keeps its fixed shape. Scharf's Chronicles of Baltimore give the copy of an inventory made in the year 1779 of the personal effects of one Thomas Edgerton a citizen of the province of Maryland, and among them is his hat, described as having a gold band and feathers. This hat evidently was the celebrated cavalier style that appears in many of the portraits of Rubens, Van Dyck, and Rembrandt, of all styles the prettiest and most picturesque ever introduced. The wide brim of the cavalier hat was arranged as suited the fancy of the wearer, some of whom allowed it to take its natural shape, some would wear it looped up on the side, and by others it was caught up and attached to the crown at different angles. In fact, it was modelled very much as the ladies nowadays do the Gainsborough, exercising their own individual fancy as to the treatment of the brim. Identical with the interests of Baltimore were the industries of other towns of the colony of Maryland, and among the earliest records referring to the hat business are several advertisements found in the Maryland Gazette, published at Annapolis. In February 1760, Charles Diggs advertises men's and boys' castor and felt hats. In 1761, Barnet West advertises gold and silver band hats just imported from London. And in April 1761 appears the advertisement of Nathaniel Waters of Annapolis, who announces that he has for sale silver and gold buttons and loops for hats, and that he carries on the hat-making as usual. About this time, Annapolis, being in her palmy days, was the center of gentility and fashionable life. Here was congregated the blue blood of English aristocracy, who strove to foster and cultivate the same courtly splendor and etiquette existing in old England, which brought to the venerable place the enviable fame of being considered the most fashionable of our colonial towns. End of chapter 2 Recording by P. J. Morgan Chapter 3 of Baltimore Hats this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by P. J. Morgan Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham Chapter 3. Period of the Revolution An indulgence of those inborn habits of luxury and fondness for rich and expensive dress by the wealthy landowners comprising the large majority of the population of the southern colonies, encouraged a demand for articles more elaborate and costly than those produced within the colonial territory. Hence imported fabrics were by them largely preferred to those of domestic make. The gay and festive social life, and the means easily acquired from their profitable crops of cotton and tobacco, permitted indulgence in lavish expenditures for articles of fashionable attire and household elegance. The general customs of the people of the South had the effect of retarding the progress of ordinary trades by not affording sufficient patronage to encourage their successful undertaking, while, on the contrary, from the greater necessity with the northern people of personal exertion and labor to provide the comforts of home life, sprung that support of manufactures which has so largely increased as to place the power and wealth of the country in their hands. The event of the American Revolution, however, somewhat changed this aspect of affairs. The genuineness of Maryland's loyalty was certainly in one way nobly demonstrated. 
and by an act of patriotic self-sacrifice gave to her an unlooked-for reward in a prosperous future. Her people quickly espousing the cause of liberty at once rejected articles of foreign make and gave choice to those of home production, thus stimulating industries in their midst which had not before flourished from lack of encouragement and support. Actuated by a feeling of sympathy for their fellow citizens of Boston, whom the British Parliament in 1774 attempted to shut out from commercial intercourse with every part of the world, the citizens of Baltimore called a town meeting, unanimously recommending a general congress of delegates, to meet at Annapolis, to take action against this indignity on American liberties. The congress met June 22, 1774, offering their heartiest support not only in resolution, but in the more substantial way of money and food, as aid to their Boston friends in the resistance to British tyranny and oppression supplementing these patriotic resolutions by one making the importation of English goods an act disloyal to the sentiment of American hearts. The earliest manufacturing hatter in Baltimore, of whom any definite knowledge can be obtained, was David Shields, who kept store at No. 14 Gay Street. As the location was on the east side of Gay, and the seventh house from the corner of Baltimore Street, it probably was about halfway between Baltimore and Fayette Streets. Here he sold to his patrons the products of his back shop or factory, which was located on the south side of East, now Fayette Street, at a point halfway between Gay and Frederick Streets. Mr. Shields' father was from Pennsylvania. David Shields was born in the year 1737, and his descendants of today include some of the wealthiest and most refined citizens of Baltimore. In Scharf's Chronicles of Baltimore, his name is mentioned in connection with others. In the year 1769, as aiding by a general subscription in procuring an engine for the extinguishment of fires, this engine was for the Mechanical Fire Company, and was the first machine of its kind in Baltimore, costing the sum of $264. Unfortunately, the information gained of Mr. Shields' business career is so meager as to leave much to the imagination. But it is natural to suppose that in 1769, being 32 years of age, he must have been established in business. That Mr. Shields was a public-spirited citizen is further proven by his connection with the First Baptist Society, being one of a committee constituted for the purpose of purchasing a lot upon which to erect a church. This was in 1773, two years before the Revolution. The church was built on Front Street, upon the site now occupied by the Merchant's Shot Tower, and was the first Baptist church erected in Baltimore. The Federal Gazette announces the death of Mr. Shields, October 4, 1811, in the 74th year of his age his funeral taking place from his residence, which was over his place of business on Gay Street. What may have been the actual condition of the hat business of Baltimore just before the Revolution has been difficult to ascertain. Mr. Shields must have been in business during this period, and it is more than probable that in a town of the size of Baltimore at that date there must have been others engaged in this branch of business. But how many and who they were cannot be ascertained. It is very likely that the restriction placed by English rule upon most manufacturing industries prior to the Revolution operated detrimentally upon this industry also, and while the ordinary kind of wool-felt hats were made by the hatter in his own shop, undoubtedly most of the fashionable hats sold and worn at that time were of English or French make. Paris, which then as well as now was the axis upon which revolved the world of fashion, possibly supplied the wants of Baltimore's high-born gentry, always famous for exquisite dress and refined taste, with the French chapeau, the ton of those days. As there are no existing detailed statistics of the business of Baltimore during the Revolutionary War, the record of some business firms has been entirely lost, and although some trades have received slight mention in the published histories of the city, a trace of the existence of but two hatters who afterwards continued in business is to be found. Since it is known as a fact that fourteen hatters were engaged in business in Baltimore not later than ten years after the close of the war, we have a right to suppose that more than two must have been in business during the existence of the war. Among the proceedings of the Council of Safety of Maryland, organized at the outbreak of the war, is found the following order. March 2, 1776, the Council of Safety authorized Major Gist to contract for fifty camp kettles and as many hats as may be necessary for the battalion, not to exceed seven shillings apiece. Again, April 6, 1776, Commissary of Stores of Baltimore is ordered to send to Annapolis 200 of the hats arrived from Philadelphia. Why Baltimore hatters did not supply the needed hats for Maryland militia we cannot say, but probably a sharp competition for so large a contract wrested it from them. 
The adoption of the cocked hat in its various forms as a portion of the military costume of the Continental Army brought about the necessity of making a distinction between civil and military wear. After the close of the American Revolution, France was in a state of civil insurrection, and the French chapeau of that time was constructed upon a plan somewhat similar to that of the cocked hat. With the termination of the French Revolution appeared the steeple-top hat, having a conical crown with stiff curled brim, drooping front and rear, being trimmed with a very wide band and ornamented in front with a huge metal buckle, a change radical enough from those preceding it, but admitting a question as to its comparative intrinsic beauty, or to its being a more becoming part of male attire. The style withal certainly proved acceptable, for with slight modifications it has continued, and is now embodied in the fashionable silk hat of the present time. Thus with the opening of the nineteenth century commenced the era of what may be correctly termed the high hat. Ashton, in old times, says of the style of 1790-95, to 95, the cocked hat had gone out, and the galling yoke of the chimney-pot was being inaugurated, which was as yet of limp felt. In fashions prevailing at the opening of the new century, particularly those of wearing apparel both for ladies and gentlemen, Paris took the lead, and though with many articles today Parisian designs and ideas secured the largest share of popularity, yet in regard to hats for gentlemen, it can be proudly said that American-made hats are ahead in point of style and quality, and are no longer dependent upon foreign ingenuity for assistance in securing for them a ready sale. In fact, no American industry today stands in a more enviable position relatively to foreign manufacturers than does that of hat-making. The fancy for sentimental hits and political phrases indulged in by modern hatters seems to have been the rage at an earlier period, as is evident from the following, published in the London Times of December 4, 1795. If the young men of the present day have not much wit in their heads, they have it at least in their hats. Among the pleasantries we have seen in this way are the following. Not yours. Hands off. No vermin. And rip this as you would a hot potato and other charming sallies of refined and elegant vivacity. But the wittiest lines are the political ones. The other day we observed one perfectly clean and tidy in which was written, Avant, guinea pig! And on the lining of a very powdery hat that lay in the window of the same room were inscribed the two monosyllables, Off Crop. Guinea pig and off crop were probably local political distinctions of the day. End of chapter 3 Recording by P. J. Morgan Chapter 4 of Baltimore Hats This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham Chapter 4 after the revolution not until after the revolution is it apparent that any attempt was made in baltimore to concentrate the hatting industry into a legitimate business upon any extensive scale or to separate the manufacturing from the retail branch of business in fact far into the new century was it the practice of those who manufactured extensively for the trade to continue to keep in operation also a retail establishment the general system of conducting the hat business at the time of which we are now writing was for the hatter to have his back shop in the rear and accessible to the front shop where the proprietor and his prentice hand made the needed supply for the existing or future small demand likely to come for hats in those days were built for service not for show and in a manner quite different from those suited to the modern requirement of almost a monthly change in style then the principal demand came from maturing youth, desiring to assume suitable dignity for entrance into manhood, by procuring a beaver, which, unless he lived to a patriarchal age, might serve him during his natural life, and that too without fear of banishment from society for being out of the fashion. In the first Baltimore City Directory, printed in the year 1796, appear the names of nineteen hatters, the business locations of some of the number, it is curious to observe, being at places hardly recognizable by those living at the present day. Gay Street, prior to the year 1808, extended from the water to Griffith's Bridge, now called Gay Street Bridge, 
beyond which it was called Bridge Street. German Lane is now German Street. East Street is Fayette Street, and the euphonious name of Cowpen Alley is now dignified by that of Garrett Street. Baltimore Street was then called Market Street, and for a long time after was often designated by either name. The following names and localities of hatters are found in the Baltimore City Directory, published in 1796. Richard Averson, German Lane, between Howard and Liberty Streets. Joseph Burnett, Welcome Alley, Federal Hill. Peter Bond, 13 Bridge Street, Old Town. William Branson, 131 Market Street. Peter Bees, 31 Charles Street. Frederick Deems, Cowpen Alley. Joseph Berniston, 17 George Street, Fells Point. Joseph Berniston, Shop, 19 George Street, Fells Point. George Littig, 141 Market Street, Shop on the Causeway. Arnold Livers, Shop, 24 South Calvert Street. Aaron Mattison, Shop, East Street, Between Calvert and Gay. William Mockby, East Street between St. Paul's Lane and Charles Street. Gaspar Morelli, 36 Charles Street. John Parks, Shop, 14 Light Street. Jacob Rogers, 29 South Street. George Smith, 101 Bond Street. David Shields, 14 North Gay Street. John Steiger, 250 Market Street. John Underwood, Alley between St. Paul's Lane and Calvert Street. Daniel Weaver, 19 Front Street. Judging from localities here given, ten of this number were engaged in business as principals. The others were probably journeymen, working at their trade in the various shops in the town. John Parks, who did business at 14 Light Street, had his residence at 137 Market Street, about the location now occupied by Clog and Son as a shoe store. In the year 1802, number 137 Market Street was occupied by John Woolraven, hardware and silversmith, and John and Andrew Parks are in the dry goods business at number 2 Market Space. William Branson, at 131 Market Street, appears to have continued business in the same place up to the year 1810, during the years 1800 to 2, the firm was Branson and Son. Their store was the second house west of Grant Street, then called Public Alley. The place is now occupied by George Steinbach and Son as a toy establishment. Aaron Mattison, whose shop in 1796 was on East Street, in 1799 associated his son with himself in business, locating at 16 North Gay Street, next door to David Shields. In 1802, William Mattison, probably the son, opened a store at 180 Market Street, the firm continuing at 16 North Gay Street as Aaron Mattison and Son. The next year, W. Mattison appears at 72 Market Street, following which no further record is found of this firm. Number 180 Market Street was two doors east of Charles on the north side, now occupied by Towner and Land Street's rubber store. Number 72 Market Street was also on the north side, second house from Lemon, now Holiday Street. Peter Bond, whose location was number 13 Bridge Street, continued as a hatter in the same place until the year 1806. Afterwards, he appears to have changed the character of his business, for in 1807 he is found to be a storekeeper at number 9 Bridge Street. Number 13 was on the north side of what is now Gay Street, the seventh or eighth house beyond the bridge over the falls. Peter Bond was a member of the Committee of Vigilance and Safety, organized by the citizens of Baltimore in the dark days of anxiety and trouble preceding the invasion of the city by the British in September 1814. Richard Averson had his residence on German Lane between Howard and Utah Streets. At that time, 
there was but one dwelling house on german lane between hanover and liberty streets german lane now german street then extended only from charles to green street mr averson kept his hat store at number four county wharf which was the lower terminus of south calvert street he had for his neighbors gerard t hopkins peter cox and george mason grocers david shields continued in business at his old locality fourteen north gay street certainly until the year eighteen o eight and probably up to the time of his death in eighteen eleven in eighteen nineteen his place was found to be occupied by francis foster as a hat store arnold livers would seem to have been the most peripatetic of hatters and must have caused no little stir and comment among his fellow tradesmen until eighteen o one he appears as solitary arnold livers carrying on the hat business at twenty four south calvert street where probably he had a retail shop in eighteen o two the directory records arnold livers twenty four south calvert street and on fayette street probably his residence also seventy cumberland road livers and atkinson thirty five fell street and livers and atkinson ten george street fells point in eighteen o four arnold livers is still at twenty four south calvert street also at seventy market space and george atkinson has succeeded to the firm of livers and atkinson in eighteen ten it is livers and grover thirty nine south corner of water street from this time mr livers disappears entirely one may imagine what a commotion this evidently unsettled man of business must have raised during ten years of these varied and numerous changes and possibly others of which the directories give no account so rapidly and effectively does time erase the evidence of former labours and so quickly is the past forgotten that one is surprised and disappointed at not finding more proof on record of what these worthy apostles of work may have done of the nineteen whose names are in the directory of seventeen ninety six traces of the personal history of but two of the number can be found these are david shields before alluded to and john parks in griffith's annals of baltimore john parks is mentioned in the year seventeen eighty four as subscribing ten pounds to the funds raised by citizens for the purpose of elevating the courthouse to admit the extension of calvert street then the courthouse stood in the bed of calvert street which it spanned where since has been erected and now stands battle monument commemorating the loss of baltimore's brave citizens who gave their lives in defence of their homes against british invasion in eighteen fourteen among the patriots whose names are inscribed upon this monument by a grateful people desiring in such way to honour and perpetuate the memory of those who sacrificed themselves in the defence of their homes and firesides appears that of joseph burniston a hatter who is found in seventeen ninety six doing business at nineteen george street fells point thus while little else is known of mr burniston's career he is immortalized by a noble deed and his name is handed down to coming generations to show what sacrifices were made in securing to us that freedom and comfort we now possess sacrifices which should inspire us with a determination that when similar calls come we will be ready to answer as unhesitatingly as did this patriotic hatter from the location of mr burniston's place of business it may be inferred that he was only a hat maker having no front shop or retail establishment but was merely a maker of hat bodies to be sold to retailers who themselves finished and trimmed them ready for sale of the hatters of seventeen ninety six there is but one through whom can be connectedly traced baltimore's hat industry from before the revolution down to the present time that one is jacob rogers whose long continued business career brings personal knowledge of him down to a time quite within the recollection of some now living singularly enough by this solitary instance we are able to connect hatting in seventeen sixty nine 
with that of 1890 for it is known that mr. Rogers learned his trade with mr. David Shields who was in business in 1769 and engaged in their occupation today are several who were apprenticed to mr. Rogers End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of Baltimore Hats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dore. Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham. Chapter 5 Early in the 19th Century. Oh, wonderful were the recuperative powers of the American people after undergoing the trials and sacrifices consequent upon a protracted struggle for liberty as to surprise the most sanguine advocates of self-government following the train of war came ruin and desolation but freedom was the birthright of the people who though sorely tried by a tremendous outlay in blood and money were by no means disheartened or discouraged and without delay they cheerfully took in hand the task of renovation with the same resolute determination that characterized the conflict with their enemies the contributions of maryland to the country's wants during the war were always generous in both men and money baltimore after recovering from the exhaustion consequent upon her constant participation in the seven long years contest for freedom commenced the foundation of her future commercial greatness and early in the present century she had attained a commerce greater in extent than that of many older seaport towns baltimore clippers were celebrated for their marvelous speed and their white sails were to be seen in the ports of every foreign nation baltimore kept steadily advancing in population and wealth compared with her rivals she was precocious the town was settled in the year seventeen thirty and its increase shows evidence of growth that must have created a surprise in its early days similar to that now experienced by the development in a few weeks of a full-fledged western city with its thousands of inhabitants from its humble foundation of a few straggling hamlets new york was settled in sixteen fourteen boston in sixteen thirty philadelphia in sixteen eighty two each being well on in existence before baltimore was born at the close of the revolutionary war the population of baltimore was five thousand in eighteen hundred it was twenty six thousand six hundred fourteen the first united states census taken in eighteen ten places the number at thirty five thousand five hundred eighty and in eighteen twenty it had grown to be a prosperous commercial city of sixty two thousand seven hundred thirty eight inhabitants the persistent patriotism of baltimore throughout the revolutionary war was proverbial the strong intelligence of a majority of its citizens though of foreign birth gave them an intuitive knowledge of the distinction between right and wrong and a fine sense of honor and justice prompted them to act as well as theorize consequently their personal convictions as to the allegiance they owed their adopted country enabled the city of their choice to assume a strong and patriotic attitude in behalf of america's struggle and incited them to act with the native element in expelling from their midst all who indulged in hostile acts or expressions but one sentiment prevailed in baltimore during the period of the war that of loyalty to country the courteous attention and honor paid by citizens to many of those who attained distinction in the war lent great assistance to baltimore in quickly recovering from the damage she had sustained and gave to the city a renown for hospitality which has remained by her to the present day washington lafayette count rochambeau and many others united in unrestricted praises of baltimore's patriotism and liberality and general Vallette, who commanded a french division of troops declared i will never forget the happy days i have passed among you citizens of baltimore and i beg you will believe that your remembrance will be forever dear to my memory the famous general green of rhode island on his way homeward from the war in the south stopped in baltimore and gave his impression of the city in seventeen eighty three as follows baltimore is a most thriving place trade nourishes and the spirit of building exceeds belief 
not less than three hundred houses are put up in a year ground rents are little short of what they are in london the inhabitants are all men of business the period from eighteen hundred to eighteen thirty although interrupted by the war of eighteen twelve when the city was made the immediate battleground was marked by a wonderful growth in both commercial and industrial occupations and in common with the general prosperity of the place hat-making also flourished in eighteen ten maryland is found from the united states census reports to have taken the lead in the production of fur hats aside from the custom with some retailers of making and finishing the hats they sold we find in the year eighteen eighteen several firms engaged in the manufacture of hats the products of these factories were distributed throughout the entire south a section the natural resources of which enabled its people to easily recuperate from the war and quickly become large purchasers and consumers of goods which they did not themselves manufacture in addition to this desirable field of business was the region of the far west then comprising ohio kentucky and tennessee the rapid increase of which in population by emigration greatly enlarged the demand for the products of baltimore's hat industry this being the most accessible seaport city regular traffic by wagon trains was established connecting baltimore with the west and giving to the former such superior advantages as to enable its enterprising merchants to secure a large trade which they long and tenaciously held the city directories of that period were not as nowadays issued annually but at intervals of three or four years and while furnishing much valuable information cannot be relied upon for complete correctness the main object of the compiler being to get the names of householders and businessmen while many who were temporarily employed and all who were unmarried though permanently employed were omitted from registration thus the directory of eighteen eighteen does not give a full list of hatters in this city at that time for while it appears that there were in operation in baltimore twenty-five hat establishments in the year eighteen eighteen five or six of which were extensive manufactories the directory does not show any fair proportion of the number that then must have been engaged in the occupation of hat making it may be safely estimated from the extent and the activity of this branch of business at that time that it gave employment to at least three hundred hands before the year eighteen ten the taper crown or steeple top had yielded to the uncompromising demands of fashion and a style appeared quite different from that which existed at the opening of the century it had so expanded its crown as to become bell in place of taper a change so manifestly popular that the bell crown since that time though subject in a greater or lesser degree to occasional alterations in its proportions has been for a dress hat the generally accepted style in the style of eighteen ten fashion indulging as she not infrequently does in a gymnastic somersault from one extreme to another went in this instance quite as far as prudence would allow the crown was about seven inches in height and about eight and one quarter inches across the tip with a brim about two and a quarter inches wide the hat being thickly napped with long beaver fur and trimmed with a wide band and buckle following the year eighteen ten there came a reduction in heights of crowns as well as in the proportions of bell and a modified style prevailed until the year eighteen thirty five when it again developed into an extreme bell shape with a very narrow brim a style so utterly extravagant as to bring it into ridicule end of chapter five early in the nineteenth century chapter six of baltimore hats this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jennifer door baltimore hats by william t brigham chapter six some old firms of the hatters engaged in business in baltimore during the early part of this century many are worthy of more than passing notice as men of honest character strict in their dealings and successful in their business undertakings gaining the respect of their fellow townsmen and becoming honored and trusted citizens of a growing community 
When it is known what were the social surroundings of the old-time hatter in his youth, it seems a matter of surprise that such good fruit should spring from so unpromising soil. No one was supposed to be capable of conducting the retail hat business unless he had served his term of apprenticeship to the trade. An apprenticeship in those days was no trivial matter. It meant the surrender at an early age of home with its parental influences, a most dangerous experience for the untrained youth to encounter and was entered into by contract for a term of years, binding master and hand to its faithful execution, not merely a verbal agreement between parties themselves, but one solemnly executed by parent and employer, ratified and signed before a magistrate, and made binding, after all this legal form, by the attachment of the portentous seal of the orphan's court, before the boy could be considered bounden as an apprentice to the trade. This was virtually a surrender of all domestic control, giving to one not of kith or kin absolute guardianship of the boy. The habits and morals of the prentice were often a secondary consideration, if not wholly neglected. Thus, as a class, the journeyman hatters often developed into loose, shiftless migratory characters spending their liberal wages freely with no ambition beyond that of daily support and the surprise is that from such a source came notably honorable men whose lives seemed to contradict the whole theory of the influence of early training. To these worthy pioneers belongs the credit of laying a secure foundation for a trade that from humble beginnings has developed into one of the most prominent industries of the country, requiring extensive capital, liberal business capacity, and one that gives employment to a large, intelligent, and skillful class of people. Among those conducting the hatting business in Baltimore at the opening of the present century, Mr. Jacob Rogers, from his long and successful business career, as well as from being the only one through whom it has been possible to connect this special industry as it existed before the Revolution with that of the present time, ranks most prominently. What year Mr. Rogers commenced business cannot be ascertained, but as early as 1796, being nearly 30 years of age, he is found established at the corner of South and Second Streets, and in the year 1844, almost the middle of another century, after the lapse of nearly 50 years, and while actively engaged in business pursuits, his life was suddenly ended, his funeral taking place from his residence at South and Second Streets, his home for more than half a century. About the year 1805, Mr. Rogers erected a large factory on 2nd Street, near Triplett's Alley, now Post Office Avenue. This building was about 150 feet long, 40 wide, and four stories in height. Afterwards, a wing extension of considerable proportions was added. This establishment was one of the big concerns of the day and Mr. Rogers was credited with conducting at this time the most extensive and prosperous hat business in the United States. Today not a vestige remains of Mr. Rogers' factory, and upon its site is the extensive structure of the Corn and Flour Exchange. His store at the corner of South and Second Streets still remains, however, having been remodeled from that of Mr. Rogers' time, the ground floor being now occupied by H. W. Totebush as a cigar store. In 1819, Mr. Rogers took his partner in business, his eldest son, George, the firm becoming Jacob Rogers and Son. In 1823, Mr. Rogers leased from the Carroll family the property number 129 West Baltimore Street at the corner of Public Alley, now Grant Street, where a branch establishment was opened, both establishments being continued up to the time of Mr. Rogers' death in 1844, at which time the firm was Jacob Rogers and Sons, William, another son, having been admitted about the year 1835. Upon the occasion of celebrating the laying of the cornerstone of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in Baltimore, July 4, 1828, a great event in the annals of the city, the exhibition of trades was a most prominent feature of the immense procession, and none made a finer display than the Hatters, George Rogers commanded that division, a description of which is thus given in the Baltimore Gazette and Daily Advertiser of July 5, 1828. 
the hatter's car was drawn by four horses showing the men at work in the several stages of hat making the group attracted much attention they carried a banner with a white ground and on the shield was a beaver resting on a scroll bearing the motto with the industry of the beaver we support our rights crossed with implements of the trade the whole supported by the motto we cover all basil sollers commenced business in seventeen ninety nine at number sixty eight market street a location on the north side of the street four doors east of what is now holiday street in eighteen o three he removed to number twenty two market street also on the north side four doors west of harrison street this latter place was previously occupied by brant and hobby as a hat store in eighteen o one and by stansbury and hobby in eighteen o two mr sollers continued in business on market street until the year eighteen thirty one when he removed to north gay number fifteen on the northwest corner of front street his factory was on east now fayette street three doors east of lemon street mr sollers continued in the manufacturing business until about the year eighteen forty james gould and company started hat manufacturing at number three water street in the year eighteen o two water street at that time was numbered from calvert to south street subsequently from south to calvert and lately renumbered as formerly number three the second building from calvert is now occupied by j e warner and company commission merchants in eighteen o seven joseph cox succeeded to the business of james gould and company and kept a retail store on the corner of south and water streets mr cox had the reputation of making a superior class of hats excelled by no manufacturer in the country selling at both wholesale and retail requiring more extensive accommodations he located his factory on the corner of little water and calvert streets where now stands the large warehouse of keen and haggerty tinware manufacturers in eighteen twenty nine disposing of his hat business to boston and elder he associated with himself his son james the firm becoming james cox and son dealers in hatters furs and wools at number one south liberty street in latter years the members of this firm having acquired a competency retired from business joseph pearson was established as a hat manufacturer in eighteen o nine having his shop on green now exeter street old town he changed his business in the year eighteen twenty four to that of dealer in furs for which baltimore in early days was a good market the catch of the trappers of the alleghanies and of the pioneers of the new west finding their way to baltimore and the otter and muskrat of lower maryland virginia and north carolina also coming in large quantities to this market the fur business of baltimore was then of sufficient importance for jacob astor to make mr pearson his representative agent in latter years the firm became joseph pearson and son dealers in hatters furs and trimmings at two sixty baltimore street all the members of this firm being dead edward connolly who was in their employ succeeded to the business afterwards changing it to a general hat jobbing business which is still conducted by edward connolly and son at two o seven west baltimore street john amos was a well-known and respected hatter of old town who commenced business as early as the year eighteen o nine at number thirty nine bridge street on the north side of the present north gay street between high and exeter his back shop or factory was on hillen street he continued business during the period of thirty years at the same place and died in eighteen forty seven at the age of sixty seven end of chapter six some old firms chapter seven of baltimore hats this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham. Chapter 7 Patriarchs of the Trade. Gleaning more closely in the historic field of the early part of the century, others are found whose enterprise contributed largely to this important industry of Baltimore, and whose successful prosecution of the hat business 
maintained the credit and position won by their predecessors. In the year 1814, Runyon Harris erected a large hat factory on Fish, now Saratoga Street. This building was about 125 feet in length and two and a half stories high. The business of this establishment was carried on under the style of the Baltimore Hat Manufacturing Company. While evidence cannot be given, it may be inferred that Mr. Harris must, before this date, have been engaged elsewhere in the city in the manufacture of hats, as others entering into business about this time are known to have been apprenticed to Mr. Harris. In 1817, Aaron Clapp and Company commenced the retail hat business at 146 Market Street on the north side, five doors east of St. Paul Street, and probably identical with the present 104 East Baltimore Street, recently occupied by John Murphy and Company, publishers. Messrs. Clapp and Company having secured a good location by purchasing the factory of Runyon Harris, engaged extensively in the manufacturing business, which was continued by their several successors down to the year 1864, when results of the Civil War, so disastrous to Maryland's manufacturing industries, caused its temporary abandonment, but the enterprise established by Messrs. Aaron Clapp and Company has, by an unbroken series of firms, continued to the present time, being now represented by Brigham Hopkins and Company. In 1817, Henry Lamson kept a first-class retail hat store at No. 5 South Calvert Street, the locality now the southwest corner of Carroll Hall building. In 1822, the firm of Aaron Clapp and Company and Henry Lamson consolidated, making the firm Lamson and Clapp and continuing the retail business at No. 5 South Calvert Street in connection with manufactory. Mr. Lamson, in 1827, went to the West Indies in search of health and died on the island of St. Thomas. He was a gentleman of much social refinement and was held in high esteem as a citizen. In the year 1827, the firm of Lamson and Clapp was dissolved by the death of Mr. Lamson, and Mr. William P. Cole was admitted the firm becoming Clapp, Cole, and Company. After the death of Mr. Clapp, which occurred in 1834, his widow's interest was retained, and the firm was changed to Cole, Clapp, and Company. Following this, Mrs. Clapp retired, and Mr. Hugh J. Morrison became a member of the firm, which was made Cole and Morrison. In 1842, Thaddeus and William G. Kraft became interested, the firm becoming Cole, Kraft, and Company, still continuing business at No. 5 South Calvert Street, the same place established by Lamson and Clapp. About the year 1850, the firm removed to No. 218 West Baltimore Street, now 10 East Baltimore Street, and occupied by Likes, Burwanger, and Company, Clothiers. In 1853, Mr. Cole associated with him his son, William R., the firm being William P. Cole and Son. In 1857, the firm moved to No. 274 West Baltimore Street, present number 46, where they remained until the year 1867, removing then to occupy the building which they had erected at number 30 Sharp Street, now 24 Hopkins Place. 
In 1861, Mr. William T. Brigham was admitted to the firm, it then becoming William R. Cole and Company. In 1870, the firm name was again changed to Cole, Brigham and Company, which was dissolved in 1877 by the withdrawal of Mr. Brigham, in which year Mr. Brigham associated with Robert D. Hopkins as the firm of Brigham and Hopkins, locating at number 128 West Fayette Street, present number 211, which firm of Brigham and Hopkins continued until 1887, when it was changed to Brigham, Hopkins and Company by the admission of Isaac H. Francis. In 1884, Brigham and Hopkins erected the large and handsome building at the corner of German and Paca Streets, which the present firm continued to occupy as a factory and sales room. In 1810, Andrew Ruff is found at number 72 Camden Street, likely to have been his place of residence. Whether he was then engaged in business is not known. But in 1817, he had a factory on Davis Street between Lexington and Saratoga Streets, the site now occupied by the stables of the Adams Express Company. About the year 1822, he established a retail store at 158 Baltimore Street. In 1842, the firm was Andrew Ruff and Company at 194 Baltimore Street. At one time, Mr. Ruff was foreman in the manufacturing establishment of Clapp and Cole. Henry Jenkins, in 1822, was a hat manufacturer at 28 Green Street, Old Town, and from 1824 to 1830, Messrs. H. and W. S. Jenkins kept a hat store on the northeast corner of Baltimore and Calvert Streets, where afterwards was erected the banking house of Josiah Lee and Company, now occupied by the Pennsylvania Railroad Company as a ticket office. Joseph Branson was a hatter in the year 1827 at 182 Market Street. He was a son of William Branson, who was engaged in the same business from 1796 to 1817. Joseph Branson ranked as the fashionable hatter of that time. He was a man of considerable military distinction in the state. He raised and commanded the famous Marion Rifles, a superb military organization of the city, to which was accorded the honor of receiving General Lafayette upon his visit to Baltimore in 1824. Mr. Branson is said to have been the first to introduce a thorough system of military tactics in Baltimore. He served several terms in the city council and was an active, enterprising citizen. In the year 1831, he went out of business and took the position of inspector in the custom house. Mr. Charles Grimes was a well-known hatter who commenced business at 42 Baltimore Street about 1823. In 1831, he removed to number 29 North Gay, near High Street. He evidently had a love for his first choice, as in 1833 he is found again at 42 Baltimore Street. Mr. Grimes retired from business as early as the year 1839. He was extremely fond of the Maryland sport of duck shooting, in which he was associated with many of Baltimore's sporting gentlemen. In 1853 he removed to Philadelphia, enjoying a life of comfort and ease. He was an exemplary man in all the relations of life, and died in the year 1868 at the advanced age of 73. In 1810, 
john petticord was learning his trade with jacob rogers being then fourteen years of age his honesty and faithfulness were appreciated by his employer and in eighteen fourteen he occupied the position of foreman in mr rogers factory after continuing in that capacity for some time he commenced the manufacture of hats on his own account continuing it until the feebleness of age compelled him to abandon it thomas sappington was a hat manufacturer who in the year eighteen thirty one was located at number one twenty baltimore street which at that time was at or near the present number one sixteen east baltimore street he had his factory on north street near saratoga it is known that he was in business for a number of years but what year he commenced and when he abandoned business cannot be ascertained victor serrata was a frenchman who located in baltimore as early as eighteen thirty eight he opened a retail store at two fifty nine baltimore street and was the first one to introduce the silk hat in this city william h keevil was a hatter doing a retail business in eighteen forty two at sixty six and a half baltimore street he was evidently of the buncombe style and conducted his business in a sensational manner advertising extensively and brazenly as will be seen from the following quotation from an advertisement of his printed in eighteen forty two Quote, who talks of importing hats from england while keevil is in the field shaw tis sheer folly for while he continues to sell his beautiful hats at his present reduced prices any such speculation as importing hats from europe will be a no-go or non-effect the hatters therefore on the other side of the atlantic had better keep their hats at home as it would be quite as profitable for them to send wooden nutmegs and sawdust hams to new england or coals to newcastle as hats to baltimore to compete with the well-known keevil his business existence could not have been of long continuance as in eighteen fifty his name is not found in the city directory at the close of the first half of this century there were several who afterwards attained prominence both in business and a public capacity among whom were joshua van sant samuel hines charles tosen george k quayle james l mcphail p e riley john boston ephraim price robert q taylor lewis ramo and others the last two mentioned being the only ones now living end of chapter seven chapter eight of baltimore hats this is a livervox recording all livervox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kimberly Krause. Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham. Jacob Rogers, Number 8. To one man, more than any other, belongs the credit of establishing upon an extensive scale of the hat business, which, in the early part of the present century, was so prominently identified with the growth and prosperity of baltimore that person was jacob rogers whose business career in his native city extended over a period of more than fifty years fortified by a reputation that brought the universal respect of his fellow citizens and leaving a worthy example for those who succeeded him jacob rogers was born in the year seventeen sixty six as in those days boys were apprenticed at an early age it may be supported that when he was fifteen years old 
he was in the employ of david shields with whom it was known he served his term of apprenticeship at hat making in seventeen ninety six mr rogers is found the proprietor of a retail hat store at the corner of south and second streets he was an enterprising man and succeeded in building up a business of large proportions he died in eighteen forty two possessed of a fortune amounting to three hundred thousand dollars a large accumulation for those days in eighteen o five he built an extensive factory on the second street near tripolet's alley now post office avenue and adjoining the old lutheran church the spire of which then contained the town clock these old landmarks are now all removed from the location occupied by the stately edifice of the corn and flour exchange the number of hands employed by mr rogers at this factory and front shop was about one hundred including apprentices his plank shop comprised five batteries aggregating thirty men in the finishing shop he employed about twenty-five and he had usually bound to him as many as fifteen apprentices this would appear to be a large force for a hat manufacturing concern of that early period but it must be remembered that the manual labor bestowed upon one hat then was more than that of some thousands in the present day of labor-saving machinery that mr rogers was a strict disciplinarian and an excellent business man is proven by the perfect control he exercised over the large number in his employ whom he ruled with a firm hand yet with a wise judgment and while rebuking any disobedience of orders was feared respected and loved for his strict sense of honor justice and propriety he boarded under his own roof nearly all his apprentices to the trade a few were privileged to lodge at his home while their board was supplied by their master as one of the stipulations of their indenture so jacob rogers immediate family which was not a small one was greatly enlarged by the addition of fifteen to twenty wild untamed prentice boys what would have been the domestic condition of such a family without the ruling influence of a stern master only those can imagine who know the kind of material of which the journeyman hatter of those days was composed he was a veritable tramp as a rule with mr rogers chastisement immediately followed misconduct with him the present was given opportune time for punishment and whether in home the shop or on street any of the shop boys were found doing wrong correction was given in the then customary way by flogging mr rogers was a conscientious member of the methodist church and maintained a high character for honesty and probity and recognized as a fair man in all his dealings a good story is told to show though driving a keen bargain he was careful not to misrepresent in his store one day he was divulging to a friend some of the secrets of his business showing how successfully a prime beaver napped hat could be made with the slightest sprinkling of the valuable beaver fur a trick just then discovered soon after a purchaser appeared inquiring for a beaver naped hat mr rogers expatiated upon the marvelous beauty of the tile and his customer put the question mr rogers is this a genuine beaver hat my dear sir said mr rogers i pledge my word that the best part of the material in that hat is pure beaver the hat was bought and paid for and the customer departed well satisfied with his purchase at once mr rogers was catechized by his friend who had earnestly watched the trade remarking why mr rogers 
did you not tell me that there was but a trifling amount of beaver in that hat you just sold and you a church member so misrepresent to a customer my friend replied mr rogers i made no misrepresentation i told my customer the honest fact that the best part of the material of which the hat was made was pure beaver and so it was the journeyman hatter of mr rogers time was a character migratory in his ways his general habit being to work for a short time in the season or less in one place then from desire of change or lack of employment to seek for pastures new as railroad travel was not then thought of and stage-coach conveyance a luxury at most times beyond the pecuniary means of the itinerant hatter the journey was usually made on foot application for work could not be made to the proprietor but must necessarily go through the medium of an employee frequently an applicant in straitened circumstances who failed to be shopped appealed to his more fortunate fellow workmen to relieve his destitute condition who always made a ready and hearty response by providing for his immediate wants and starting with him again on his pilgrimage with a light heart and a wish for good luck this constant wandering habit frequently brought the hatter of those days to a condition of abject dependence and supplied a large proportion of that vagrant class now denominated tramps it was often the boast of these hatter tramps that in the period of a year or two they would make the tour of the entire country from portland maine to baltimore in the south and pittsburgh then far west shopping a while in some town or village and then marching on in search of another chance in season when labor was in demand good workmen did not apply in vain but most hat factories were subject to dull times between seasons necessitating a reduction in the number of hands this general plan was a productive of irregularity in the habits of the workman allowing him to have no settled place of habitation baltimore however was an exception to the general rule her factories proving constant employment for her workmen thus encouraging a deeper interest in their vocation it is said that in business mr rogers never knew what dull times were he kept his hat factory in active operation all the year round this prosperous condition of things had the tendency to make the baltimore hatter somewhat of a permanent settler thereby identifying him more closely with the interest and the growth of his own city and causing him to become personally concerned in its success and prosperity and experience quite different from that of his fellow workmen elsewhere who were constantly changing their habitation thus the baltimore hatter was reared under conditions favorable to his improvement by serving his apprentice days under the influence of a conscientious master the effect of this early training was manifest in his noble character as a good citizen ever after often securing for him in the place of his birth positions of trust and many of baltimore's best citizens some of her noblest men received their early training in that model hat shops of their own city with the growing trade of the city the business of hat making kept steady pace the prosperity of the south and constant development of the west provided baltimore with a wide outlet for her products though the business channels of this young and enterprising city flowed a large proportion of the products of the mills and factories of new england assisting materially the business activity of this place and it is quite likely that the interest of baltimore and new england at that time being so connected is an explanation why so many new england people migrated to baltimore in those days of her prosperity 
with characteristic energy and enterprise mr rogers extended his business pushing forward into new fields as the settlement of the country advanced besides a large trade with the entire south the wagon trains which were the expresses of those days distributed his goods throughout the states of ohio indiana and kentucky and tennessee thus securing to him at that time the most extensive business in hat manufacture conducted by any one firm in the united states fortune favored mr rogers and during his whole business career there was no interruption in the progress of this industry in baltimore not until his death or after the middle of the century was there any noticeable decline the eventful business career and commendable private life of mr rogers ended on the tenth of april eighteen forty two he falling suddenly in the old light street methodist church while attending divine service the baltimore son of april eleventh eighteen forty two mentioned his death as follows the illness of jacob rogers esq occurred in the light street church he fell in a faint from which he died an hour after at his residence number nine south street he was well known and respected as one of the most worthy industrious and valuable cities of baltimore end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of Baltimore Hats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham. Chapter Nine. Old Methods. Just as the first half of the present century was expiring. An invention was made that at once revolutionized the whole system of hat making a machine was patented in the united states by h a wells in the year eighteen forty six which successfully accomplished the work of making or forming a hat in a very short space of time which heretofore had required the slow tedious and skilful labor of the hands thus so equally dividing the century that the first half may be practically considered as following the old method and the latter half as using the new method so remarkable was this invention that its introduction quickly produced a change in the character of hats by greatly reducing their cost of manufacture together with the change in the manner of conducting the hat business to show up the old method of hat making that existed prior to the use of the wells machine is the purpose of this chapter the greater part of the information here given having been gained from an article in sears guide to knowledge published in eighteen forty four let us enter a baltimore hat shop of fifty years ago and watch the making of a single hat fur and wool constitute the main ingredients of which hats have always been made because possessing those qualities necessary for the process of felting the finer and better class of hats being made of the furs of such animals as the beaver bear martin minx hare and rabbit the skins of these animals after being stripped from the body are called pelts when the inner side has undergone a process of tanning the skins obtain the name of furs in a restricted sense and the term is still more restricted when applied to the hairy coating cut from the skin the furs to which the old-time hatter gave preference were the beaver the muskrat the nutria the hare and the rabbit of which the first was by far the most valuable these animals all have two kinds of hair on their skins the innermost of which is short and fine as down the outermost thick long and more sparing the former being of much use the latter of no value to the hatter after receiving the skins or pelts which are greasy and dirty they are first cleaned with soap and water then carried to the pulling room where women are employed in pulling out the coarse outer hairs from the skins which is done by means of a knife acting against the thumb 
the fingers and thumb being guarded by a short leather shield the skins are then taken and the fur cut or cropped from them which is done by men dexterously using a sharp knife formed with a round blade such as is used nowadays in the kitchen as a chopping knife by keeping this knife constantly moving across the skin the fur is taken off or separated without injury to the skin which is to be tanned for leather or consigned to the glue factory the cutting of furs however had become before 1844 a business in some measure conducted by itself and a machine had been invented to separate the fur from the skin which though it might be considered now a simple affair was at that time looked upon as a wonder we have said the women in the pulling room cut tear or pull out the long coarse hairs from the pelts and that these hairs are useless to the hatter but it is impossible completely to separate the coarse from the fine fur by these means and therefore the fur when cropped from the pelt is conveyed to the blowing room finally to effect the separation the action of the blowing machine is exceedingly beautiful and may perhaps be understood without a minute detail of its mechanism a quantity of beaver or any other fur is introduced at one end near a compartment in which a vane or fly is revolving with a velocity of nearly two thousand rotations in a minute we all know even from a simple example of a lady's fan that a body in motion gives rise to a wind or draught and when the motion is so rapid as is here indicated the current becomes very powerful this current of air propels the fur along a hollow trunk to the other end of the machine and in so doing produces an effect which is as remarkable as valuable all the coarse and comparatively valueless fur is deposited on a cloth stretched along the trunk while the more delicate filaments are blown into a receptacle at the other end nothing but a very ingenious arrangement of mechanism could produce a separation so complete as is here effected but the principle of action is not hard to understand if there were no atmosphere or if an enclosed place were exhausted of air a guinea and a feather however unequal in weight would fall to the ground with equal velocity but in ordinary circumstances the guinea would obviously fall more quickly than the feather because the resistance of the air bears a much larger ratio to the weight of the feather than that of the guinea as the resistance of air to a moving body acts more forcibly on a light than a heavy substance so likewise does air when in motion and acting as a moving force when particles of sand or gravel are driven by the wind the lightest particles go the greatest distance so it is with the two kinds of fur in the blowing machine those fibers which are finest and lightest are driven to the remote end of the machine the body or foundation of a good beaver hat is generally made of eight parts rabbit's fur three parts saxony wool and one part of llama vicuña or red wool a sufficient quantity of these for one hat about two and a half ounces is weighed out and placed in the hands of the boa on entering the bowing room a peculiar twanging noise indicates to the visitor that a stretched cord is in rapid vibration and the management of this cord by the workman is seen to be one of the many operations in hatting wherein success depends exclusively on skillful manipulation a bench extends along the front of the room beneath a range of windows and each boa has a little compartment appropriated to himself the bow is an ashen staff from five to seven feet in length having a strong cord of catgut stretched over bridges at the two ends the bow is suspended in the middle by a string from the ceiling whereby it hangs nearly on a level with the workbench and the workman thus proceeds the wool and coarse fur first separately and afterwards together are laid on the bench and the boa grasping the staff of the bow with his left hand and plucking the cord with his right hand by means of a small piece of wood causes the cord to vibrate rapidly against the fur and wool by repeating this process for a certain time all the original clots or assemblages of filaments are perfectly opened and dilated 
and the fibres flying upwards when struck are by the dexterity of the workman made to fall in nearly equal thickness on the bench presenting a very light and soft layer of material simple as this operation appears to a stranger years of practice are required for the attainment of proficiency in it the bowed materials for one hat are divided into two portions each of which is separately pressed with a light wicker frame the light mass of fluffy fur after being pressed with the frame is covered with a wet cloth over which is placed a piece of oilcloth or leather called a hardening skin until by the pressure of the hands backwards and forwards all over the skin the fibers are brought closer together the points of contact multiplied the serrations made to link together and a slightly coherent fabric formed these two halves or bats are then formed into a hollow cap by a singular contrivance one of the bats nearly triangular in shape and measuring about half a yard in each direction being laid flat a triangular piece of paper smaller in size than the bat is laid upon it and the edges of the bat being folded over the paper meet at the upper surface and thus form a complete envelope to the paper the two meeting edges are soon made to combine by gentle pressure and friction and another bat is laid on the other in a similar way but having the meeting edges at the opposite side of the paper the double layer with the enclosed paper are then folded up in a damp cloth and worked by hand the workman pressing and bending rolling and unrolling until the fibers of the inner layer are incorporated with those of the outer it is evident that were there not a piece of paper interposed the whole of the fibers would be worked together into a mass by the opposite sides felting together but the paper maintains a vacancy within and when withdrawn at the edges which is to form the opening of the cap it leaves the felted material in such a form as to constitute when stretched open a hollow cone the battery is a large kettle or boiler open at the top having a fire beneath it and eight planks ascending obliquely from its margin so as to form a sort of octagonal workbench five or six feet in diameter at which eight men may work the planks are made of lead near the kettle and of mahogany at the outer part and at each plank a workman operates on a conical cap until the process of felting or planking is completed the battery contains hot water slightly acidulated with sulfuric acid the cap is dipped into the hot liquor laid on one of the planks and subjected to a long felting process it is rolled and unrolled twisted pressed and rubbed with a piece of leather or wood tied to the workman's hand and rolled with a rolling pin from time to time the cap is examined to ascertain whether the thickness is sufficient in every part and if any defective places appear they are wet with a brush dipped in the hot liquor and a few additional fibers are worked in considerable skill is required in order to preserve such an additional thickness of material at one part as shall suffice for the brim of the hat when the felting process has been continued about two hours it is found that the heat moisture pressure and friction have reduced the cap to one half its former dimensions the thickness being increased in a proportionate degree assuming a conical shape the cap is then taken to the waterproofing or stiffening room where the odor of gum resins and spirits gives some intimation of the materials employed gum lac gum sandrac gum mastic resin frankincense copal caoutchouc spirits of wine and spirits of turpentine are the ingredients all of a very inflammable nature of which the waterproofing is made this is laid on the cap by means of a brush and the workman exercises his skill in regulating the quantity at different parts since the strength of the future brim and crown depends much on this process after another heating in a hot room called stoving by which the spirit is evaporated the exterior of the cap is scoured with a weak alkali to remove a portion of the gummy coating and thereby enable the beaver fur with which it is to be napped or coated to adhere a layer of beaver fur is spread and by means of the hardening stick 
is pressed and worked into a very delicate and light felt just coherent enough to hold together this layer which is called a roughing or roughing is a little larger than the cap body and to unite the two another visit to the battery is necessary the cap being softened by immersion in the hot liquor the roughing is laid on it and patted down with a wet brush a narrow strip of beaver being laid round the inside of the cap to form the underside of the future brim the beavered cap is then wrapped in a woolen cloth immersed frequently in the hot liquor and rolled on the plank for the space of two hours the effect of this rubbing and rolling is very curious and may be illustrated in a simple manner if a few fibers of beaver fur be laid on a piece of broadcloth covered with tissue paper and rubbed gently with the finger they will penetrate through the cloth and appear on the opposite side so likewise in the process of roughing each fiber is set in motion from root to point and enters the substance of the felt cap the hairs proceed in a pretty straight course and just enter the felt with the substance of which they form an intimate union but if the rolling and pressing were continued too long the hairs would actually pass through the felt and be seen on the inside instead of the outside of the cap the workman therefore exercises his judgment in continuing the process only so long as is sufficient to secure the hairs in the felt firm enough to bear the action of the hat brush in after days at length the cap is to assume somewhat the shape of a hat before it finally leaves the battery the workman first turns up the edge of the cap to the depth of about an inch and a half and then draws the peak of the cap back through the center or axis so far as not to take out the first fold but to produce an inner fold of the same depth the point being turned back again produces a third fold and thus the workman proceeds till the whole hat has acquired the appearance of a flattish circular piece consisting of a number of concentric folds or rings with the peak in the center this is laid on the plank where the workman keeping the substance hot and wet pulls presses and rubs the center until he has formed a smooth flat portion equal to the intended crown of the hat he then takes a cylindrical block on the flat end of which he applies the flattened central portion of the felt and by holding a string down the curved sides of the block he causes the surrounding portion of the felt to assume the figure of the block the part which is to form the brim now appears a puckered appendage round the edge of the hat but this puckered edge is soon brought to a tolerably flat shape by pulling and pressing the workman then raises and opens the nap of the hat by means of a peculiar sort of comb and then shears the hairs to a regular length connoisseurs in these matters are learned as to the respective merits of short naps and long naps and by the shearer's dexterity these are regulated the visitor recognizes nothing difficult in this operation yet years of practice are necessary for the attainment of skill therein since the workman determines the length of the nap by the peculiar position in which the long light shears are held a nap or pile as fine as that of velvet can be produced by this operation however carefully the process of blowing may be performed in order to separate the coarse fibers of the fur from the more delicate there are always a few of the former left mingled with the latter and these are worked up during the subsequent processes women are employed therefore after the hats have left the finishers in picking out with small tweezers such defective fibers as may present themselves on the surface of the hats lastly the hat is placed in the hands of a workman whose employment requires an accurate eye and a fertile taste in matters of shape and form this is the shaper he has to study the style and fashion of the day as well as the wishes of individual purchasers by giving to the brim of the hat such curvatures in various directions as may be needed simple as this may appear the workman who possesses the requisite skill to give the acceptable curl to the brim which is to create the finishing touch for the hat is a desirable hand and can command a high rate of wages thus in our imaginary tour 
through an old-fashioned hat factory we have seen the many skillful manipulations then required to make a hat which when compared with modern processes awaken in our minds a sense of wonder at the change end of chapter 9Chapter 10 of Baltimore Hats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kimberly Krause. Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham. John Petticord, Number 10. The subject of this article, who died in Baltimore, October 11th, 1887, in the ninety-second year of his age, was probably the oldest hatter in the United States. His identity with the Baltimore hatting all the days of his life made him prominent in connection with that industry. Born but a few years after the thirteen states had by compact formed the Republic, Washington being President of the United States, Mr. Petticord lived to see in office that president down to that of president cleveland when he was a young man of business savages roamed and tented where beautiful and populous cities with all the advantages of refinement and art now exist during his lifetime the population of his own city changed from twenty five thousand to four hundred thousand and the united states extended its area of territory from the limits of the thirteen original states, which was three hundred and sixty seven thousand square miles to upwards of three million, increasing its population from five million to sixty million. When John Pennycord first made hats, the cocked or the continental style was in vogue. No more curious museum could be collected than specimens of the various freaks of fashion in hats that appeared during the lifetime of this old hatter john petticord was born in baltimore in 1796 at an early age he was apprenticed to john amos to learn the trade of hatting soon after finishing his service of apprenticeship he secured work in the establishment of jacob rogers he was faithful to his duties serving his master with that same conscientiousness that he would have done for himself, soon becoming foreman of Mr. Rogers' extensive factory. After serving with Mr. Rogers for some years, he entered into business as a manufacturer on his own account, and continued until feebleness of age compelled him to abandon it. He was a man of quiet, simple habits, his chief ambition being to lead an upright life and appear before God and his fellow creatures an honest man. John Petticord was exemplary in character and habits, modest and gentle in his disposition, pure in his faith and in his living. He had no enemies and was always known as a reliable man. During his long career as a foreman or master of the shop, he never had a quarrel or serious difficulty with the many who came under his control. He never drank intoxicating beverages although in his early days that was the general custom which with hatters was unfortunately the universal habit his manliness and strength of character were also well displayed by his never chewing or smoking tobacco he was patient and methodical an indefatigable worker at his trade believing that undivided attention to his work was a duty he owed to others john petticord was a patriot being one of that noble band who fearlessly stood and successfully resisted the british attack upon baltimore 1814 at that time he was a youth of nineteen working at his trade at new time on the eventful september twelfth 1814 the tocsin was sounded to call arms every able-bodied citizen to defend his home and fireside and, if possible, prevent the destruction of their beautiful city. At the first sound of the cannon, which was the signal agreed upon, John Petticord, 
left his unfinished noonday meal seized his musket and was one of the first to join the ranks of his company the day was desperately hot and forced march of two miles to the battlefield brought them dusty tired and thirsty face to face with the enemy who was in a fresh condition and eager for fight petty cord's canteen as all others by regulation orders was filled with whiskey but he being a temperance man would not assuage his thirst with grog famished for water he obtained permission from his superior officer to a short distance away where a squatter was dispensing cider for the comfort of the soldiers and profit to himself petticord emptying his canteen of whiskey on the ground had filled it with hard cider and quenched his thirst with a good round drink the hard cider together with heat and exhaustion came about as near ending the earthly career of john petticord as did the storm of the enemy's bullets which whizzed about his head on that trying day the bravery of this man was well tested he stood manfully in position while his comrade on the right fell dead at his feet and the one on his left was removed wounded from the battlefield he himself receiving a slight wound on the finger the riderless white horse of the british general ross who had just been killed pranced in front of the rank in which mr petticord was stationed and the hearts of himself and his comrades beat lightly with hope of success as the shouts of the americans echoed along the line announced the death of the invaders great leader encouraging a grand rally that gave them the victory of the day mr petticord though a brave soldier in the time of this country's need was a man of peace and upon the ending of hostilities with great britain resigned his position in the eighth company of the twenty seventh regiment of maryland militia baltimore always honors her noble band of brave defenders and upon each anniversary of the twelfth of september a public celebration is given the old defenders company occupy the post of honor it is but a few years since they marched with lively and steady step to martial music later on age required their appearing in carriages in the procession and each year at the annual dinner given by the city their number has grown less and less the present year but three were on earth to answer to the roll call and but one able to appear at the banquet who can realize the sad feelings of the last of the, such a noble band feeble old age with its infirmities mindful of its duty sat perhaps for the last time around the banquet board where with friends and comrades he before had enjoyed happy and jovial times his spirits were cheered and the occasion made as pleasant as possible by the presence of many of baltimore's honored citizens but not to see a single face of the many with whom during the seventy-five long years he had kept up a pleasant association it is an experience others cannot imagine with mr petticord's death but two are left of that noble band who so bravely protected our rights and fought for and firmly secured that liberty and freedom we of the present day are enjoying end of chapter ten chapter eleven of baltimore hats this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham Chapter 11 Middle of the Century Baltimore hat manufacturing interests at the middle of the century suffered greatly by comparison with those of an earlier period. That which had been a prominent industry, engaged in by active, enterprising men, and extending steadily and widely, keeping pace with the growth of the country, and giving encouragement to the continued employment of skilled labor, 
was at the middle of this century gradually falling off in volume and importance and continued to decline until what was once a thriving and prosperous industry of the city became one almost of insignificance in the government census of 1810 the statistics regarding hat manufacturing placed maryland as leading in the manufacture of fur hats while connecticut new york new jersey and pennsylvania gained rapidly still this business in baltimore continued to increase and grow until during the period from eighteen twenty five to eighteen fifty it reached the height of its prosperity before the year eighteen fifty the once prominent concern of james cox and sons had retired from the hat manufacturing business and the oldest and wealthiest firm was contemplating liquidation as messrs george and william rogers of the firm of jacob rogers and sons had decided to discontinue the business left by their father choosing to follow other occupations the retirement of these two firms so long and closely identified with the mercantile and manufacturing industries of baltimore which had successfully contributed by their faithful business labors to its growth and prosperity was a serious blow to the interests of the city this change left in the field but one important firm who had been their contemporary cole craft and company of which the late william p cole was the active business partner this firm followed in succession the business established in 1814 by runyon harris and was the predecessor of the present firm of brigham hopkins and company much speculation might be indulged in as to the real cause of the decline and loss to baltimore of so important an industry but the plain facts force but one conviction namely the unwillingness of these successful old manufacturers to adopt newer methods of hat making leading to such reduction in cost through improvements as to preclude the chance of their successful competition with those of more progressive ideas while baltimore hat makers clung tenaciously to the old ways whereby labor and expense were incurred unnecessarily those at the north were readily adopting the various new methods by which improvements in the art of hat making were constantly being made thus with the use of newly invented machinery the cost of making hats was greatly lessened and the northern manufacturer constantly gained in competition with those of baltimore the invention of the world's forming machine added largely to the misfortune of this business an expensive machine with a comparatively tremendous production required a large market as an output a heavy royalty also was attached to it and the business of baltimore at that time appeared not to be in condition to justify its introduction though the machine was invented in eighteen forty one it was not until the year eighteen fifty two that the venture was made to introduce into baltimore the wells hat body forming machine with the pecuniary assistance of william p cole Mrs. Bailey and Mead, in 1852, commenced hat-forming by machinery, the mill being located on Holiday Street, and afterwards removed to Front Street, present number 320. From failure of support caused by inability to revive the depressed condition of the hat business, the venture of Messrs. Bailey and Mead was not successful, and Mr. Mead, retiring from the firm, the business was continued by Mrs. Bailey, Craft & Company, mainly in the interests of Mr. Cole's factory, until about 1869, when hat-forming by machinery in Baltimore was entirely abandoned, followed with the retirement of Mr. Cole from the manufacturing business. Charles Towson, who established himself in the retail hat business in 1836 on Utah Street near Lexington, entered into partnership in 1853 with Mr. Mead, the firm being Towson & Mead. They commenced hat manufacturing at number 10 Water Street in the factory formerly occupied by James Cox and Sons. The business was carried on for about one year, when it was abandoned and the firm was dissolved. Other parties made fruitless attempts to restore to Baltimore the prestige it once held in this business. To one person, however, is due the credit of maintaining a long, persistent and noble fight against odds and difficulties, 
and who after all chances to restore vitality to an apparently pulseless enterprise seemed lost retired from the contest unscarred and full of honors after a creditable business career of forty-six years carried on in the same factory where fifty-two years before he entered service as a boy this person was mr william p cole who engaged in the manufacturing business in eighteen twenty seven as a member of the firm of clapp cole and company at the time of mr cole's retirement from the manufacturing business he was associated with his son william r cole and his nephew william t brigham as the firm of william r cole and company who were then engaged in the jobbing hat business and located at number thirty sharp street now twenty four hopkins place in the year eighteen seventy the firm was changed to cole brigham and company mr cole retiring from active business only upon the dissolution of that firm in eighteen seventy seven having been engaged in business on his own account more than half a century leaving behind a record bright with faithfulness to duty unspotted by any unmanly business transaction brilliant in having met every business obligation for during the whole course of a long business life he so systematically managed his affairs as to allow him to pass safely through the many perilous business periods he encountered as a manufacturer mr cole acquired a wide reputation for the class of goods he produced and when the demand was most exclusively for soft felt hats those manufactured by him were considered the best made in the united states and were sought by retailers far and near while at the outbreak of the civil war there may have lingered a vital spark in the hat industry that event gave it apparently a death thrust the relative position of baltimore to both sides was disastrous to its business interests being close upon the dividing line of hostilities the sympathies of a large part of its citizens were enlisted in the cause of the south while singularly enough the larger proportion of the wealth and business interests of the city was centered in persons allied by family ties to those of the north who earnestly upheld the cause of the union cut off from all intercourse with the south its legitimate field for business the share of western trade that was enjoyed by baltimore was lost by the strategy of war for with the partial destruction of the baltimore and ohio railroad the channel of her western trade was diverted and it drifted in other directions while dissension and strife were being stirred in baltimore and her industries lying dormant business at the north was being stimulated by state and government calls for articles necessary to equip an army for service hats were a needful part of an army's equipment and northern hat manufacturers were called upon for the supply their factories soon assumed the life and activity of prosperity creating a demand for additional skilled labor with good pay this induced the unemployed baltimore hatter to migrate and seek other places for his support thus did baltimore part with an industry of importance closely identified with its prosperous early days which after passing through many vicissitudes dwindled gradually until it became apparently extinct end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of baltimore hats this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Lynn Thompson Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham Chapter 12 Fashions The high crown hat, vulgarly termed stovepipe, may be taken as the general indicator of fashions existing during the period of the present century. Following the cocked hat, the counterpart of the French chapeau, which style prevailed at the time of the American Revolution, was the steeple top, which had a conical crown this shape for a high hat was soon abandoned and the bell crown substituted and so acceptable has this particular style proved that since the opening of this century it has held supremacy as the fashionable head covering for man despite frequent attempts to destroy its popularity by the introduction of other shapes or the advocating of a change as practical 
high hats were first napped with beaver fur which material being expensive necessarily made costly hats otter fur was afterwards used then muskrat which greatly lessened their cost scratch or brush hats terms used for hats made with a felt body and afterwards combed or scratched until a nap was raised were manufactured and worn prior to the middle of the century these were all stiffened high hats and constituted the dressy article of headwear until the introduction of the silk hat which for the last fifty years has maintained its ascendancy as the leading article of fashion in gentlemen's hats about the year eighteen thirty the beaver hat assumed high proportions of crown having a very heavy bell measuring full seven inches in height and nine inches across the tip to this crown was added an insignificant brim of only one and a half inches in width these hats were covered with a beaver nap of such a length that it waved with the wind and its appearance upon the head of the wearer was as outre and unique as the shako on the head of a modern drum major to more forcibly illustrate the proportions of this style of hat we may say that its actual capacity was nearly a peck besides the high hats of either beaver brush or silk caps made of cloth or fur were much used prior to the introduction of the soft felt hat and continued to be so until an incident occurred which created a sudden revolution in the tastes of the american people regarding their headdress the visit of louis kossos the eminent hungarian patriot to this country in the year eighteen fifty one had the effect of producing a wonderful change in the fashion of hats the one worn by kossos was a high unstiffened black felt trimmed with a wide band and was ornamented with an ostrich feather the immense popularity of this famous foreigner with all americans brought about the fashion of a similar hat never before or since in this country did the introduction of a new fashion in hats spread with such rapidity as did the kossuth all hat factories in the country were taxed to their utmost capacity to support the demand until every american citizen old and young was to be seen wearing a soft hat ornamented with an ostrich plume it was the kossuth that marked the era of the introduction of the soft or slouch hat and stimulated the sale of that undress article of headwear which continued in vogue throughout the united states for a number of years the soft hat appeared in many forms and styles some of which became universally popular the wide awake brought out during the election campaign of abraham lincoln in the year eighteen sixty was a noted and successful style it was a low crown white felt with wide black band and binding robert bonner's original and successful advertising of his newspaper the new york ledger was a sensation of the day and the ledger was the name given to a soft hat that commanded a great sale the peculiarity of the ledger was a narrow leather band and leather binding the resort brim was an american invention introduced about the year eighteen sixty three it was simply a wire held to the edge of the brim of a soft hat with a binding and so extended as to maintain a flatness and permit its conforming to the head without destroying its outlines this invention was patented and its extensive use brought large profits to the owners of the patent the event of the civil war gave an increased stimulus to the use of the soft hat with the south in a state of excitement alarmed with portentous fears of a sectional war such matters as pertained to elegance of dress were banished from the minds of its people and the north with a large army recruiting from its citizen class brought the universal practice of economy among the american people limiting their indulgence in expenditures for articles of dress considered as luxuries and the silk hat falling under that ban dropped almost into absolute disuse with the return however of prosperity an apparent desire for a more dressy article was manifest and the stiff felt hat generally dominated the derby was introduced the derby was made in various proportions of crown and brim as the caprice of fashion dictated and was as its name might imply an adopted english style it gradually grew in favor with americans until it became the universal fashion of the day 
maintaining that position for several years from an increased popularity it has been brought into such common use as to again create a growing desire for an article claiming something bearing a more exclusive mark of gentility or dignity which the silk hat meets and the silk hat is again so increasing in use as to establish the certainty of its maintaining with the american people its wanted place of priority as the article of genteel headdress marking the standard of fashion and style Baltimore always noted for its readiness in accepting foreign fashions Must have been among the first of American cities to adopt the silk hat which was claimed to be a French invention But if there be any foundation for the following narrative the first silk hat was not made in Paris But in China it is stated that a French sea captain while sailing on the coast of China desiring to have his shabby napped beaver hat which had been made in Paris replaced by a new one took it ashore probably to calcutta or canton to see if he could procure one like it as parisian styles were not in vogue in china he found nothing of closer resemblance than the lacquered papier mache of bamboo straw the keen shrewdness of the chinaman however quickly suggested a near imitation in silk plush this is said to have happened in 1830 and the captain returning to Paris showed the Chinaman's product to his own hatter who upon perceiving its beauty at once attempted its introduction as a fashion which has long ruled nearly the whole world the first silk hat produced in Baltimore is said to have been made by one Victor Serrata in 1838 though some contend that Jacob Rogers was the first to make such goods but as the silk hat was looked upon as an innovation and its introduction opposed by hat makers of that time as being detrimental to their interests it is more probable that mr rogers did not give encouragement to the manufacture of an article likely to supplant the use of his own make of beavers rushes and bolivars and we may thus safely give credit to victor serrata for first producing in baltimore this new article of fashion originating in paris the city from whence he came until the year 1850 Paris fashions were those generally adopted in the leading American cities after which English fashions in hats entirely superseded the former becoming so popular that not only large importations of English hats were made but American manufacturers invariably copied English styles and indulged in the degrading habit of pirating English trademarks for the purpose of increasing their sales happily the necessity for such pernicious practices is at an end for during the past ten years the great strides made by American manufacturers in the improvements of hat making placed them in the foremost rank of that industry in fact with those elements of manufacture necessary to perfection such as fineness of texture lightness in weight and elegance in style American hatters today hold supremacy in the whole world and favored by relief from the tariff tax upon raw materials from which hats are made all of which is of foreign growth America will be found sending to the countries which taught her the art Examples of this industry far superior to those her teachers ever furnished her End of chapter 12chapter 13 of baltimore hats this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson baltimore hats by william t brigham chapter 13 new developments a strange fact is that the Civil War, so disastrous in its effect upon the industries of Baltimore, was followed at its close by the rise of a new enterprise of manufacturing straw hats, which so increased and extended that in number of establishments and volume of production, it soon outrivaled those of fur hats in their most prosperous time, thus securing to this city a kindred business greater in extent and importance than the one which had by force of circumstances been wrested from her the good reputation which the products of the new industry has acquired in every part of the country has contributed 
not only to the prosperity of the city but has assisted by adding credit for the high standard of its manufactured goods in the year 1866 mr. G. O. Wilson and mr. Albert Sumner left their homes in Foxborough, Massachusetts in search of a promising field for establishing the business of renovating straw hats without any definite place in view one city after another was visited Baltimore being finally their chosen locality Mrs. Wilson and Sumner associated with them mr. W. C. Perry who also came from Foxborough and the firm was made Sumner and Perry establishing themselves in the rear of number 71 now 10 West Lexington Street Mr. Sumner withdrawing from the firm the same year the two remaining partners continued the business at the same place as the firm of Wilson and Perry at that time the retail price of straw hats was such as to allow a profitable business to be done in renovating and altering styles and in that branch these persons met with success previous to this however others had been engaged in the business of bleaching and pressing straw hats among the first who entered into the business as far as can be learned was the firm of Rosenwig Davidson and Ash about the year 1848 they were cap manufacturers and added the pressing of leghorn hats as an auxiliary business mr. Samuel white who learned his trade of the previously mentioned firm afterwards carried on hat bleaching and pressing in connection with cap making at number 78 South Charles Street present number 132 from 1850 to 1865 extensive importations of German straw hats came into the port of Baltimore and mr. white did a large business in finishing these goods in 1857 mr. white commenced the jobbing hat business forming in 1861 the firm of white Rosenberg and company and is now in business at number 9 South Howard Street of the firm of s. white and son Richard Hill at present in the retail hat business at number 5 South Liberty Street was formerly engaged in hat bleaching and pressing at the same locality Mrs. Wilson and Perry continued to prosper in their enterprise and increasing their facilities gradually developed it into straw goods manufacturing confining their business for several years almost exclusively with two prominent Baltimore jobbing houses who supplied sufficient patronage for their constantly increasing production one of their patrons being Cole Brigham and company the other Armstrong Cater and company one of the largest millinery firms in the country in 1877 mrs. Wilson and Perry purchased the premises number 101 West Lexington Street now 104 where they secured more commodious quarters and with an admirably equipped factory continued to do a large and prosperous business mr. Perry died in 1880 in July 1887 the firm title of Wilson and Perry was changed mr. Wilson associating with M Frank JD Horner and a levering formed the firm of Wilson Frank and Horner and occupied the warehouse number 204 West Baltimore Street in connection with the factory on Lexington Street in January 1875 Isaac H Francis and James E Sumner who had been in the employ of Wilson and Perry started the straw hat manufacturing business at the northwest corner of Lexington and Liberty Streets and in the following year William T Brigham then of the firm of Cole Brigham and company became associated with them the firm being made Francis Sumner and company in 1877 the firm of Cole Brigham and company was dissolved mr. Brigham becoming connected with R.D. Hopkins as the firm of Brigham and Hopkins occupying the premises number 128 West Fayette Street present number 211 in 1880 mr. Hopkins was admitted as a partner in the firm of Francis Sumner and company and mrs. Francis and Sumner became members of the firm of Brigham and Hopkins the interests of the two firms having always in fact been identical since they were first established the two firms were continued until July 1887 when by the withdrawal of mr. Sumner 
they were dissolved and became consolidated as the firm of Brigham Hopkins and Company now occupying the large and spacious factory at the corner of German and Packer streets erected in 1884 in the year 1880 Messrs. Francis Sumner and Company placed their interest in their Lexington and Liberty Street factory with William Fales and James M. Hopkins, transferring their own entire business to the enlarged premises at 128 West Fayette Street. Fales and Hopkins continued at the corner of Lexington and Liberty Streets until the fall of 1883, when Mr. Hopkins, forced by declining health to give up business, sold his interest to Mr. Louis Aldous Louise, the firm becoming Fales and Aldous Louise. Mr. James M. Hopkins died of consumption at Colorado Springs, February 1884. In 1885, S. C. Townsend and John W. Grace became associated with Mrs. Fales and Aldous Louise, and a new firm formed as Fales, Aldous Louise and Company, continuing for two years when it was dissolved, Mrs. Townsend and Grace remaining as the firm of Townsend, Grace and Company, at 128 West Fayette Street, while Mrs. Fales and Aldersluise formed a new firm as Fales, Aldersluise and Company, locating at 115 South Utah Street. Mr. Fales remained in the latter firm but a few months, when it was again changed to that of Aldersluise Brothers, comprised of Louis, Adrian and Eugene, Aldous Louise, now doing business at 115 South Utah Street. In 1878, Mr. M. S. Levy, who was then a cap maker, commenced the finishing of straw hats, having the hats sewed by others, while he did the finishing and trimming, his place of business being then at the northeast corner of Sharp and German Streets. With increasing trade, Mr. Levy removed in 1881 to more spacious quarters at numbers 318 and 320 West Baltimore Street, present numbers 216 and 218, where he commenced the general manufacture of straw hats. In 1883, he took his two sons into partnership, the firm being made M. S. Levy and Sons their premises being destroyed by fire in october eighteen eighty six they removed to one hundred and seventeen south sharp street in september eighteen eighty eight being again the victims of fire they occupied temporarily the premises northeast corner of packer and german streets remaining there until taking possession of their present extensive factory located at the northwest corner of packer and lombard streets in eighteen eighty Toms Richardson and Company commenced in a small way to manufacture straw hats at number 341 West Baltimore Street, now 317, but from lack of business experience soon abandoned the undertaking. Mrs. Bateman and Richardson in 1882 embarked in the business occupying a portion of the premises, number 5 South Liberty Street. In 1883, Mr. Scutch was admitted as partner, the firm becoming Bateman, Richardson and Company, and removing to number 55 St. Paul Street, now 313, continued until 1885. Not meeting with anticipated success, they gave up the business. Mrs. Francis O. Cole and Company, in 1882, commenced the manufacture of straw goods, erecting for the purpose a building at number 7 and 9 Saratoga Street, now 424 East Saratoga, continuing business until 1885, when the firm was dissolved. Mr. R. Q. Taylor has long been engaged in the manufacture of Mackinaw straw hats as a specialty. His acquaintance with and interest in this product dates as far back as 1850, when he first used the Mackinaw for his retail trade, since which every season the Mackinaw has been the prominent straw hat sent from his establishment, and for a period of 15 years was the only article of straw hat retailed by him. The successful control of a special style of an article of fashion for 35 consecutive years is a remarkable record, an accomplishment that plainly shows ability as a leader of fashion, for which Mr. Taylor's natural capacity so well fits him. 
Mr. Taylor confined the use of the word Mackinaw hat strictly to his retail demands until after the year 1868, since when he has manufactured the article for the trade, distributing his products over the entire country, and establishing for Taylor's Mackinaws a national fame. In addition to the manufacture of men's and boys' straw hats, which class has heretofore comprised a larger proportion of such goods made in Baltimore, another branch, that of ladies' straw goods, has been developed and is already assuming interesting proportions, promising to become a valuable addition to this industry. Messrs. Walford and Schilberg, in 1883, commenced the manufacture of ladies' straw goods at No. 6 East Pratt Street, remaining at that place for one year, removing in 1883 to No. 205 Camden Street, where they are now located. In 1887, Mrs. L. W. Sumner, G. K. Thompson, and D. Whitney, as the firm of Sumner, Thompson, and Whitney, commenced the manufacture of ladies' and Mrs. Straw goods, locating their factory at 317 North Howard Street. At the present time there are in Baltimore, apparently in prosperous condition, eight straw hat establishments giving employment to 1,100 hands, male and female, and producing annually manufactured goods to the value of upwards of a million dollars, in the distribution of which Baltimore is brought into close business contact with every state and territory of the Union, and the city's importance as a manufacturing centre is enhanced by the character of articles sent forth by those engaged in this class of business. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of Baltimore Hats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Walters. Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham. Chapter 14 Growth of Business. For many years, the Mackinaw took precedence of all straw hats as the most desirable summer article for gentlemen's headwear far outrivaling in its success as a fashion any other straw product ever introduced to the American people. Having attained this prominent position mainly through its successful management by Baltimore manufacturers, it forms an important factor in the prosperity of the straw hat industry of Baltimore. In fact, it is the actual foundation of the present large and increasing straw goods business of the city today. While the Mackinaw hat had previously found favor with a few prominent retailers, it was not until the year 1868 that Mr. W. T. Brigham, then of the firm William R. Cole & Company, observing the merits of the article, concluded to undertake its introduction to the trade, to whom it was generally quite unknown. Among those who had profitably used the Mackinaw for their retail trade were R. Q. Taylor of Baltimore, Charles Oakford, W. F. Warburton, and Louis Blaylock of Philadelphia. Though it was an article of domestic production, the beauty and commendable qualities of the Mackinaw were indeed a surprising revelation to the trade at large. Each year added to the popularity of the Mackinaw until it became the acceptable American straw hat without which no first-class retailer could consider his stock complete. While the great demand existed, Baltimore continued to supply the larger proportion of all the Mackinaw hats sold and taking advantage of the reputation thus gained for such goods, her manufacturers produced other kinds of straw hats, and, by the exercise of proper care and attention, acquired such skill as to secure for the straw goods products of Baltimore the worthy reputation of being the best made in the United States, consequently and beyond contradiction, the best in the world. In the earliest days of straw hat making in Baltimore, at the time when the Mackinaw was being introduced, the sewing of straw hats by machine was a new invention, and practically a close monopoly, controlled by a combination of wealthy straw goods manufacturers of the North, who, jointly as a stock company, prevented the sale of the straw-making machines outside their own circle. Fortunately for the success of the new undertaking in Baltimore, the good qualities of the Mackinaw hat were more satisfactorily retained by hand sewing, rendering machines in their manufacture a useless requirement. Thus, an advantage was gained in supplying a hand-sewed hat, embodying such points of perfection in style and finish 
as to quite surprise those not familiar with the manufacture of such goods the mackinaw of baltimore make continued to grow in popular favor until it had secured a greater distribution than was ever before attained by any other article of straw hat making a remarkable record for tenacity by holding for upwards of fifteen successive years popularity as the leading article of summer headwear baltimore continued to enlarge and increase her straw hat factories and improve their products so now in this industry she stands in the proud position of being the leading city in the united states in the production of the best class of straw hats this in brief is a history of another branch of the hat business which attained large proportions supplementing the one which having gained a degree of importance in the manufacturing history of the city was by force of circumstances reduced to comparative insignificance the growth of the straw hat business of baltimore may be looked upon as somewhat phenomenal the first introduction of the mackinaw hat by william r colin company in eighteen sixty seven may be taken as the beginning of straw goods manufacturing and with but a single manufacturing firm existing in eighteen seventy five its development increased dates from that time it's doubtful if in eighteen seventy five the total value of manufactured straw goods produced in baltimore reached the sum of seventy five thousand dollars while in the face of a steady and constant decline in values the result of labor-saving machines together with reduced cost of raw materials an increase in the production of twentyfold is an accomplishment of less than fifteen years this success cannot be attributed to any local advantages but is due entirely to the energy enterprise and business qualifications of those engaged in the business qualifications which have accomplished the result of giving valuable assistance in the city's advancement as an important manufacturing center it has also by the recognized merits of its products lent a worthy influence throughout the whole united states in sustaining the excellent reputation long enjoyed by baltimore for the good quality and reliability of its manufactured goods end of chapter fourteen recording by april walters chapter fifteen of baltimore hats this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by J. D. Gavin. Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham. Chapter 15. History of the Mackinaw Hat. Result of the remarkable popularity of the Mackinaw straw hat was that Baltimore came rapidly forward as a straw goods manufacturing place, becoming important as a center in that particular branch of business. Therefore, a history of the article which contributed so largely to the development of this industry is likely to prove both interesting and instructive. Mackinaw, as the trade term or name, does not, as might be supposed, indicate the region from whence the article comes, but undoubtedly received its christening from some one of the few retailers who early used these goods, in order to create a distinction from a similar but much inferior article, then termed the Canada hat. While both the Mackinaw and the Canada are made of wheat straw, the difference between the two, as the product of one country and of nearly the same latitude, is a great surprise. The wheat of the eastern part of Canada produces a straw dark in color, harsh in texture, and of little use for making a hat, while that grown in the western part of the same country is clear and white in color, possessing a brilliant enamel which imparts the beauty that rendered the Mackinaw so famous as an article of fashion the mackinaw must be considered a local rather than a national production coming as it does from a region comprised within a small radius around the city of detroit part of which is canadian territory and part within the borders of the united states for while considerable straw from which the plate is made is raised and plated within the limits of the state of michigan by far the largest proportion as also the best quality is the product of the canadian territory nature seems to provide it a small community with unusual advantages for within a limited territory has been produced all the large quantity of straw plate required to supply the popular demand that for many years existed for mackinaw hats and all efforts elsewhere to produce material combining the peculiarities of this straw from which these hats were made invariably failed the claim of the mackinaw to antiquity and long use is perhaps as strong as that of other plates with which the trade has become familiar for no doubt the natives of the country made use of these hats as head coverings long before they became an article of trade the mackinaw was for many years after its first introduction sold under the designation of the canada hat the name given to a similar but comparatively degraded article produced in lower or eastern canada 
and the title Mackinac was first applied by the late Mr. Charles Oakford of Philadelphia, or by Mr. R. Q. Taylor of Baltimore, each of whom were among the first to make it a fashionable hat. The makers of these goods are wholly the poor, ignorant half-breeds, who spring from the Canadian French and the Indian. Finding that hats, as well as the skins of animals they had trapped, could be traded for, the family talent was brought into use to produce something that might contribute to their meager subsistence. So, during the winter season, while the men hunted the muskrat, Indian women and children plaited straw and made hats, which, on the opening of spring, were carried with the skins obtained by the hunters to the towns, where they were exchanged for food, drink, clothing, and ammunition. To the advantages of soil and climate is attributed that purity of color, brilliancy of enamel, toughness of fiber, and elasticity of texture, which are recommendations of the Mackinac. Added to these natural qualities was the advantage of a peculiar treatment given to the straw by the natives, who employed a whitening or bleaching process without the use of chemicals, giving increased beauty to the article. During the prosperity of Mackinac straw plating, a prominent character among the half-breeds was one Madame Lousseau a sturdy, aged matron with twelve hardy daughters who, inheriting their mother's prolific nature, were in turn each the proprietress of a family of a dozen boys and girls. They all appeared to inherit the old lady's natural ability and wonderful expertness and surpassed all competitors in the plating of the straw. The choicest products in braid and hats came from the Lousseau family. In 1834, and for many years after, these goods were sold and used only as ordinary harvest hats. It now seems surprising that an article possessing such attractive merits should have occupied a secondary position and been so long in establishing the reputation it finally secured. The first person, as far as discovered, who used this article for retail purposes as a genteel and fashionable hat was Henry Griswold in the year 1845, who did business in the then little and obscure town of Racine, Wisconsin. The Raciners must have been people of an appreciative and refined taste, as it appears that Mr. Griswold sold the hat for several seasons to his own advantage. Prior to 1846, these goods were sold in New York by Leland, Mellon, and Company, at that time the largest wholesale hat firm in the country. Mr. Mellon retired from business in 1851. In the reply to a personal inquiry of the writer in the year 1874, Mr. Mellon wrote from Farmingham, Massachusetts, as follows. The Canada straw hat from the region of Detroit was sold by our firm as early as 1845. After being blocked and trimmed, they were sold as an ordinary staple hat. We sold a few to John H. Jennon, W. H. Beeb and Company, and Charles Knox, then the leading retail hatters of Broadway. I think, however, they were sold by them only as a fishing or harvest hat. We continued to receive these goods from Detroit for several seasons until an article from Lower Canada, of inferior quality and less price, made its appearance and stopped the sale as far as we were concerned. The exact date of the appearance of the Mackinac in Philadelphia cannot be accurately determined, but it must have been as early as 1847. Messrs. Beebe Coster & Company, a prominent retail firm in Philadelphia in 1849, sold the tapering crown wide-brim Canada straw hat. From about 1855 to 1860, the Mackinac became so very popular in the Quaker City that it was recognized as a leading article. The prominent retailers then using it were Charles Oakford, W. F. Warburton, Louis Blaylock, and Sullender and Pascal. Each of these firms themselves finished the straw hats, taking them as they were sewed by the natives, which was with a tapered crown and wide brim, making little pretense to any variety in style or proportion. Messrs. Sullender and Pascal made an advanced step and undertook one season to sell the Mackinac to the exclusion of all other straw hats, preparing them in various shapes and for the first time adapting them to the requirements and tastes of a knobby trade. In 1847, William Ketchum of Buffalo, E.B. Wicks of Syracuse, and John Haywood and Sons of Rochester sold these hats. In 1848, L. Benedict and Company, prominent retailers of Cleveland, handled the goods. This firm was followed next season by Messrs. Arn and Dockstadter, then a very prominent concern in the same place. In 1849, they were sold in Sandusky by C. C. Keach. The Mackinac during these periods must have been introduced and sold in other places, but it had not secured its recognition as an article worthy of being placed on a level with foreign productions, which were then considered the desirable and suitable straw hat for genteel wear. It was probably not until after the year 1855 that the article received its title of Mackinac, and not until then did it secure its well-merited, dignified position. 
By far the largest retailer of the Mackinac hat in this country, and the one to whom belongs the greatest credit in popularizing it, is Mr. R. Q. Taylor of Baltimore. He introduced the hat to his customers as far back as 1850, and for 30 consecutive seasons sold it without any apparent diminution of popularity. For many years, Mr. Taylor sold the Mackinac to the exclusion of all other hats. At one time, so identified did the Mackinac become with the people of this city that it was said a Baltimorean might be recognized anywhere by the straw hat he wore. Mr. Taylor asserts that in the years 1872 and 1873, he retailed from his own counter in the two seasons upwards of 9,000 hats. The reputation of the Mackinac has been admirably sustained by Mr. Taylor, whose firm is still engaged in the manufacture with a constant demand for them. Probably no other straw hat ever introduced to the American people can show such a continued and extended sale. In 1868, Messrs. W. M. R. Cole & Company, predecessors of the present firm of Brigham Hopkins & Company, commenced to produce these goods for the general trade, and it is to their efforts that much of the widespread popularity of the Mackinac is due. They first tried these hats with their own local trade, and finding them eminently successful, ventured to offer them in New York, meeting with much encouragement. From a small commencement, their trade in these goods continued to increase until a large and well-established business was secured, continuing to grow in volume and extent, and becoming the precursor of the industry that places Baltimore in a leading position as a manufacturing place for straw goods. End of chapter 15 Recorded by J.D. Gavin Chapter 16 of Baltimore Hats this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Walters. Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham. Chapter 16 Modern Improvements. In the rank of those whose successful undertakings have contributed toward the restoration to Baltimore of a lost industry, and placing it upon such a foundation as to have it recognized as one of importance, no firm stands more prominent or has done more towards its accomplishment than that of Brigham, Hopkins & Company. The straw hat business, inaugurated by this firm's immediate predecessors and encouraged by their own efforts, has grown in volume and strength until Baltimore is now designated in trade parlance the straw hat city, rightfully claiming the honor of surpassing in this class of her manufactured products the efforts of all rivals in this or of any other country. Messrs. Brigham, Hopkins & Company, while possessing a large business, have the pleasure of conducting it in a spacious building, whose architectural design is one of the handsomest of its kind in the country, and whose conveniences for the successful prosecution of their business cannot be excelled. A business coming from one of its pioneers, through a direct succession of firms, gives to Brigham, Hopkins & Company a natural pride in such an inheritance, and brings also a pleasure in being able to trace its progress from its origin showing how this branch of manufacture was at an early day brought to an admirable condition of prosperity afterward to pass through a period of almost total decay then again to attain a development that entitles it to rank with any of the successful and prominent industries of the city it is a pleasant reflection as well as a happy coincidence that the restoration of a forsaken industry once a vital element of the city's life and activity is greatly due to the labors of the firm who in this branch connect the past with the present the old with the new the enterprising business traits manifested by runyon harris in erecting in the year eighteen fourteen a large hat factory in this city seems to have prompted his very successors to a spirit of emulation enabling them to preserve the legacy bequeathed them and to perpetuate that reputation for meritorious products that was so early earned in the factory of mr harris following the erection of the factory by mr harris came the firm of Aaron Clapp & Company, who purchased the property and commenced in 1817 the manufacture of hats, and a remarkable fact, one encouraging an innate pride in their successors, is that during three quarters of a century all of the firms inheriting a title of descent from that of Aaron Clapp & Company have passed in safety through every financial convulsion of the country and have promptly met every pecuniary obligation incurred. Although during the former period of prosperity in the hat business of Baltimore, felt hats only were manufactured, which business was completely reduced by the unfortunate conditions existing at the time of the Civil War, 
its revival came through establishing of a different branch that of the manufacture of straw hats and while messrs brigham hopkins and company have lately entered extensively into the manufacture of silk and felt hats also it is the purpose of this article to dwell more particularly upon facts relating to the straw hat branch that it has contributed so largely in bringing baltimore once again forward as a leading hat manufacturing city prior to 1860 Messrs. William P. Cole and Son, then manufacturers and jobbers, became especially interested in the straw goods branch of their business. Being at the time manufacturers of the best class of felt hats, the straw goods sold by them were all well made in the factories of the North. Machines for sewing the straw braid were not then in use, and much of the straw products of foreign countries came already sewed in shapes that were very irregular in proportions and sizes. The looseness of the stitches in sewing rendered the use of glue a necessity in the manufacture of the hats, producing an article of headwear that gave but little comfort. Suggestions for improvements were given the manufacturers, who adopted them with advantage to themselves. The first suggestion made by the Baltimore firm was an improvement in the appearance of the hat by trimming it with wider bands. At that time, the use of bands about 14 lines wide was very prevalent, and the adoption of 23 line bands was looked upon as a very radical departure. The substitution of leather sweats for those of oil muslin was also first undertaken by the Baltimore firm, following which the most important improvement ever gained in the production of straw goods was conceived and executed in this city, which was the abandonment of the heavy glue sizing and the manufacture of the comfortable flexible finished straw hat, an accompaniment secured by careful attention to the proper sewing of the goods aided by hand finish. For several years, William P. Cole and Son and their successors had straw hats of their own designing made and finished at the North, continuing to suggest improvements which were made at their command, and the privilege of retaining which for their own trade was for the time extended to them by the manufacturers, from which they gained such advantages as would arise from having goods superior to and differing from the general class sold by others. It was in the year 1875 upon the dissolution of the firm of Cole, Brigham & Company, that Mr. W. T. Brigham and Mr. R. D. Hopkins, uniting as the firm of Brigham & Hopkins, became straw hat manufacturers. The Mackinac straw hat had at this time gained well in popularity. The natural firmness and flexibility of the Mackinac were merits particularly acceptable to the trade, and the new firm made a careful study of embodying as far as possible in the manufacture of all their straw hats those essential points possessed by the Mackinac. So successful were their efforts that, by the exercise of thorough watchfulness, they continued to improve until they secured for their products a celebrity that gave the firm the foremost position in the trade. Following the onward movement of the straw hat business in Baltimore since its first introduction, less than 20 years ago, it is interesting to watch its constant and steady growth and to observe the advance that has been accomplished. Even before Messrs. Brigham and Hopkins entered upon the business, a great improvement in the straw goods had already been made through the favorable impetus imparted by their predecessors. Straw hats, which, from a lack of style and comfort, had heretofore played a secondary part in the conditions of a man's costume, were so much improved in style and finish as to be accepted as a desirable article of dress. Thus, an increased demand was created for them. To still further improve the straw hat, and, as near as possible, secure perfection, was the aim of the Baltimore manufacturers. Entering the field with the commendable object of producing a class of goods that should be recognized as the best, Messrs. Brigham and Hopkins, abandoning traditional ways, commenced their work upon a thoroughly independent basis, copying after none, but relying upon their own ingenuity, striving to improve upon every last effort, observing and studying the wants and needs of their customers, they continued to put forth a class of goods bearing an undoubted stamp of originality, which, being supplemented by the excellent workmanship and use of good materials, resulted in securing a large patronage and brought to them a constantly increasing trade. In this way did the firm secure a recognized position at the head of the straw hat industry of the country, and gained for their products a reputation for excellence in style and finish that is widespread over the whole country. American manufacturers had a long and tedious struggle in their efforts to overcome the prejudices of the people existing in favor of foreign productions, but steady endeavors to win the approval of Americans for American-made hats have scored a genuine success, and the American gentlemen of today 
may take a just pride in wearing a straw hat of Baltimore make, one not to be excelled. End of chapter 16. Recording by April Walters. Chapter 17 of Baltimore Hats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham. Chapter 17 A Model Establishment. That part of the history of Baltimore which relates to the present position of its hat industry is especially interesting as it records a business that has acquired large proportions placing it prominently among the many important manufactures of this city a business identified with the very earliest days of the city's existence growing and assuming in its movement a condition of vigor and prosperity that is encouraging for the future has given to baltimore a name and fame that places her in an enviable position at the very head of the hat manufacturing cities of this country as an example showing the growth and progress of the hat business and giving evidence of its extent in baltimore at the present time no better illustration can be offered than a description of the complete establishment erected by messrs brigham hopkins and company for the requirements of their extensive business while at the present time the hat business of baltimore is largely confined to the special manufacture of straw goods a revived movement made by one firm in the manufacture of silk and felt hats assures a development of that branch of the business also into such proportions that ere long it may restore to baltimore the prestige and rank it once held as the manufacturing centre of high grades of that class of goods going back to the early period of eighteen fourteen runyon harris the predecessor of this firm in advance of his time displayed evidence of progressive ideas by erecting what was then considered a large and spacious factory his structure was one hundred and twenty five feet in length about twenty five in width and two and a half stories high the area of space upon the two floors which was alone suited for work people was six thousand two hundred square feet the line of successors to runyon harris have all been found proverbially enterprising and energetic always noted as active and successful manufacturers of their day inheriting somewhat the spirit of activity so marked in their worthy predecessors messrs brigham hopkins and company are found in the advance and make no idle boast of an establishment whose breadth of space architectural beauty and convenience of arrangement find few rivals in the whole catalogue of similar business places in this country their warehouse prominently situated rises six stories above ground being one hundred and fifty feet deep by forty in width gives a surface area of forty two thousand square feet of workroom all of which is provided with unusual advantages for daylight and ventilation added to this is the detached make shop of the firm located at relay station on the line of the baltimore and ohio railroad nine miles from the city it is a high studded building of one story built in this manner to allow the condensing and evaporation of steam which escapes from the batteries of boiling water around which the men are constantly at work this building is one hundred and thirty by sixty feet giving an addition to the city warehouse 7,800 square feet, or a total, in round numbers, of 50,000 square feet, upwards of an acre of working space, which is a good showing of growth and expansion when contrasted with one of the best establishments of the year 1814. The handsome structure at the corner of German and Packer Streets was erected by Messrs. Brigham, Hopkins & Company, designed and arranged to suit the demands of their own manufacturing business. Ground was broken in the month of April 1884, and the building completed and occupied in January 1885. It has a frontage of 41 feet 6 inches on German Street, and extends back on Packer Street 150 feet to Cider Alley. Located upon one of the broadest thoroughfares, at a point which is the watershed of this part of the city, 
being at the level of one hundred feet above tide water it rises prominently among other fine warehouses surrounding it showing its array of architectural beauty to advantage for it is one of the most imposing of the mercantile structures of the city the building is constructed of baltimore pressed brick and the famous potomac red sandstone which together so harmonize in color as to render a very pleasing effect the ornamentations surrounding the windows are in terracotta and molded brick the style of the building is romanesque or round arched very striking features are the immense arched openings upon the pucker street facade being 17 feet in width and 25 feet in height which with their broad treatment of mullioned panels and heavy rough-hewn stonework give strength and character to the building these spacious windows are not simply for effect but designate the location of the principal offices and by their wide expanse afford abundance of light to the showrooms making these departments particularly attractive by their cheerful airiness and brightness that plenty of sunlight always brings throughout the whole building is a generous treatment of spacious windows flooding the interior with a bountiful supply of light so necessary to the production of properly manufactured goods as well as to the health and comfort of the work people the main entrance to this building is marked by its liberal dimension a slight elevation is made from the sidewalk and beyond a recess of several feet are framed two large front plate glass windows which afford a view of the entire extent of the first floor with its offices and extensive storage room entrance doors are placed on either side of this recess broad stairways connect every floor providing easy and quick ingress and egress at both the front and back part of the building rendering in the greatest degree security to the lives of those employed within adjoining in the rear is another structure three stories high separated from the main building by fireproof brick walls and used as a boiler room as also for other departments of work desirable to be kept apart from the general workrooms this separate building was designed as an additional means of safety in not having the large boilers within the limits of the main building from basement to roof this model factory is well equipped with all necessary modern plans for producing the best that is capable of being made in this manufacturing line end of chapter 17chapter 18 of baltimore hats this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson baltimore hats by william t brigham chapter 18 ways and means of the present time taking the start for a tour of inspection through the establishment of brigham hopkins and company one is ushered directly into the first or main floor of the building which is partly occupied by offices for the members of the firm and for the necessary clerical force as well as the showrooms for the exhibit of the products of this factory these various apartments are partitioned off with handsomely beaded cherry and a series of arched windows gives beauty to the architecture and serve the practical purpose of ventilation the several rooms upon this floor are handsomely finished in solid cherry this was done solely with the view of harmonizing the effect with that of the exterior of the building rather than for an indulgence in luxury in the first office is a capacious fireproof vault having its counterpart in size in the basement upon which the one of the office rests it is built of yellow enameled face brick and with its handsomely finished iron door surmounted with a bold decoration in terracotta adds greatly to the ornamentation of this room the desks are all of cherry large and capacious designed expressly for the required accommodation of the bookkeepers adjoining is the private office of the members of the firm among the decorations of this room is a spacious open fireplace ornamented with terracotta tile and a handsome mantelpiece in carved cherry the carpeted floor and tasty furniture serve to give that comfort that is looked for in the modern office of the businessman 
Beyond and leading from this office are showrooms for the exhibition of the firm's products. These showrooms, two in number, are without doubt the best in finish, breadth of space, and arrangement of any in this branch of business in the United States, affording the best conveniences for the display of the handsome goods they contain. The first in size, 25 by 18 feet, with an adjoining one, 18 by 12 feet, is supplied with handsomely designed showcases of solid cherry and of glass. The wall space is coloured a light tint, while the ceilings are laid off in yellow and brown. A long table of cherry occupies the centre of the large room, while the hardwood floors are partially covered with oriental rugs. When these rooms are filled with the choice products of the firm, embracing the finest qualities of straw, with their trimmings of various hues and colours, intermingled with the sombre black of the derbies and the brilliant lustre of the silk hat, upon which is thrown a bountiful supply of light that comes from the spacious windows, a striking melange of harmonious colours is produced. Here the customer is surrounded by all that is desired from which to make his decision. Beyond these showrooms is still another room devoted to the valuable collection of hat trimmings. While to the uninitiating the trimmings of a hat, consisting merely of its band and binding, may appear quite insignificant, yet to the manufacturer it is a part of great importance. Here, in this room, stored in various quantities, are two hundred different designs of hat bands, every one of which is the product of a French or German loom, mostly made from original designs furnished and sent abroad to be executed for this firm. From this, the last of the series of departments on this floor, exit is gained to the remaining space, which is used for the packing and storing of goods ordered and received finished from the factory with an ascent to the second floor by a broad stairway the finishing department of silk and fur hats is entered this department occupies the entire space of this floor here the silk hat is made and finished complete and the derby whose process of manufacture belongs to several departments receives its finishing touches of curling and setting the brim after which it is neatly nested in tissue paper and placed in paper boxes to be sent to the packer the third floor provides three departments that of silk and felt hat trimming straw hat trimming department and that very valuable and necessary auxiliary to business the printing department although two branches of the hat business are carried on under the same roof that of straw and that of silk and felt hats they are kept entirely separate and distinct in all their requirements and details, which affords a reason for the difference in aspect of the trimming departments on this floor. In one, the multitude of busy hands is at work upon hats of black, while in the adjoining department, the many nimble fingers are handling the light and delicate straw and the bright ribbons, making a contrast of the sombre with the gay. Entering the next department, we find that element of development, that force of propulsion, by means of which modern business plans are moved and executed, the printing press. This department is fitted and furnished complete with such requirements as are necessary to the advance of an enterprising business. A large Gordon press, propelled by steam power, is kept constantly in use to supply the vast amount of printing required in the details of this business tips labels size marks tickets for the use of the various departments of making sewing sizing finishing and blocking order tickets coupons boxes and box labels and mercantile printing are but a portion of the work done here in addition a patent gas heating press is used for printing in gold and silver leaf there also emanates from this department a monthly trade journal conducted under the auspices of the firm ascending to the fourth floor the noisy sound of machinery is first heard this is the department for sewing straw braid here unquestionably centers the interest of a hat factory the hum of a hundred machines quickens the pulse and to the observer the interest and astonishment increases as the wonderful machine 
with its lightning speed guided by the magic touch of the young woman who rules it draws towards itself yard after yard of the delicate strand of straw plait which it sews together by the finest stitch of the most slender thread till suddenly a hat comes forth complete in its full perfection of shape one surprise would not be more greatly heightened by a display of the magician's art the marvel of this accomplishment may be effectively demonstrated by a simple statement that bit of mechanism occupying a space of ten by twelve inches with its apparently simple arrangement of levers and cogs merely carrying a needle to and fro up and down will do in a single minute the work an industrious woman with her unaided fingers could not do in less than an hour that little machine is capable of doing within the working hours of a day the labor of sixty women while a hundred machines in the factory are capable of producing the handwork of six thousand people this shows the progress of the world and the advance that has come to this branch of industry within the last thirty years straw braid preparatory to being sewed is wound upon reels from which it is easily fed to the sewing machine this department of winding and reeling is also located upon this floor adjoining is the machine room the department is not only the hospital for invalid and incapacitated machines where they receive the treatment required to put them in suitable working condition but its field of usefulness is extended to the making of much of the required machinery implements and various tools used throughout the establishment another flight of stairs and the fifth floor is reached this is the straw hat pressing department occupied entirely by men here are the more weighty evidences of labor and work heavy and powerful hydraulic presses are used in shaping the ordinary kinds of straw hats and the necessary metal moulds that form the dies for these machines represent tons of zinc also in this room is row after row of benches equipped for that special branch of hand finish which has so greatly assisted in the reputation of the straw hats sent from this establishment these benches each accommodate six workmen are supplied with a labor-saving appliance of great merit the invention of one of the firm's employees and at present in use only in this factory which is that by means of rubber tubes a combination of gas and air is carried into the pressing irons by which heat is regulated to any required degree the advantage of this may be realized when it is known that heretofore these press irons were heated by slugs or pieces of iron or steel which drawn from the furnaces of anthracite coal fires were encased in the hollow irons by this new invention a remarkable saving is made by the abandonment of the furnace in the coal necessarily used also in the not insignificant matter of time consumed by the presser in the constant replenishing of slugs its work is acceptable to the workman and desirable for securing an improvement to the goods the next the sixth floor has a department of both the straw and felt hat branches of the business the finishing department of felt hats is a large room 150 by an average of 25 feet closely studded on three sides with large windows which at this height throw upon the workman an unobstructed flood of light affording unusual advantages for the most thorough perfection in the finish of these goods this room has capacity for 100 finishers allowing generous space for each giving the convenience and comfort that but few factories afford their workpeople adjoining is the department of bleaching and dyeing of straw plaits this department is supplied with all the modern conveniences for securing the best results large wooden vats receive the straw plaits for a thorough cleansing before it is ready for manufacture bleaching tubs are near at hand and large copper vats with all the required steam attachments for dyeing the many desired colors are here conveniently arranged ascending still another flight of stairs the drying department is reached this is the most spacious of all the many divisions of this establishment for it has the sky for a ceiling and unlimited space being virtually upon the roof here ninety feet from the ground 
is carried on one of the important divisions of the straw hat business two large rooms really houses in themselves are built upon this roof these are the bleach houses which are provided with artificial stone floors rendering them thoroughly secure from the chance of ignited brimstone coming in contact with any part of the woodwork of the building the remaining space upon the roof equal in its extent to two good-sized city building lots is secured around and over by a substantial wire netting within this enclosure the hats and straw braids coming from the bleaching and dyeing departments are dried ascent has been provided by stairways leading from the front part of this building descent is also had by the rear where broad stairs are partitioned off from the workrooms making a continuous spacious hallway from top to basement a wise precaution taken in consideration of the safety of the lives of those employed this building capable of accommodating six hundred workpeople is provided with the most convenient means of escape in case of fire by these broad stairways at each end of the building as additional precaution for safety the boilers supplying the required steam for the various departments as well as for the motive power and heat are in a building adjoining the main one but separated by a fireproof brick wall and is only accessible by entrance from the outside here are located two boilers with a combined capacity of 100 horsepower above this boiler room are two departments desirable to be kept apart from the others these are the molding and casting departments in one of which is made the vast number of plaster shapes and blocks required in the factory and some idea may be gained of the quantity when it is here mentioned that this department converts annually 200 barrels of plaster of Paris into hat blocks in the casting department there are necessary melting furnaces and other requisites for casting metal dyes parts of machinery and the various things needed in a large manufacturing business two large freight elevators reaching from basement to roof each of one ton capacity and propelled by steam power are placed in the building these elevators are furnished with automatic attachments by which as they ascend and descend each of the floors open and close thus avoiding permanent openings the frequent cause of accidents and assistance in the spread of conflagration an additional small elevator gives the convenience of transmitting light packages to and from every floor electric bells and tubes afford telephonic communication with every department steam heat radiates throughout the entire building and a reel of hose attached to a water supply is in readiness upon each floor in case of fire the length of steam gas and water pipes throughout the building is estimated at five miles the telegraph call box signals for the messenger and the telephone aids in the execution of the advanced method of reducing the detailed requirements of a large business to a perfectly controllable system in its management the engine supplying the motive power for this establishment is located in the basement with exception of this room partitioned off for the engine the entire space of the basement of this large building is used for receiving and storing raw materials used in the manufacture of both straw and fur hats here the visitor's imagination may indulge in a wide scope and his thoughts wander away to many foreign lands for in this storeroom are found the products of nearly every country in the world china is seen in its strong and durable straw plaits japan a new and formidable rival shows its handsome goods far off india contributing its products while england france and belgium send their choice plats italy germany and spain are represented as also south america canada and our own united states while the hawaiian islands make a pretense at competition with the world in the making of straw plats by submitting creditable specimens of their native products furs for making derby hats are also here sent by russia france and germany in observing the firm's connection with countries quite encompassing the entire globe some idea of the extent of this business may be realized thus a fair description is here given of a thoroughly equipped hat factory existing in baltimore in the year eighteen hundred and eighty nine 
and the reader may realize by comparison the advance of improvement from the last decade of the 18th century to the commencement of the last decade of the 19th century. The End End of Chapter 18 End of Baltimore Hats by William T. Brigham